I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen peoples, the Songhees, and the Squimalt. We are here to learn, to share, and be in this space with you. Thank you for being our hosts. We extend our appreciation and opportunity to live and learn with you. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you, the public, and those present on stage to the public meeting of the council at the CC. A special welcome goes to our CC council, Canadian Environment Minister Stephen Gilbo, US EPA Deputy Administrator Janet McCabe, and Subsecretary of the Environment Ivan Rico. And to the Joint Public Advisory Committee chaired by Octaviana Trujillo, who's here with us today, and of course, to the Traditional Ecological Knowledge Experts Group facilitate, facilitated by Kathy Hodgins-Smith, as well as to the many other experts from our three countries that are here with us today. Together, we will engage in dialogue with the Council this afternoon. I'd like to remind everyone why we are here today. It is not merely because we have to be, because we are implementing our treaty-based mandate. Yes, that is certainly the first reason why we're here today. I don't need to tell this audience or any of you that we are facing a very real climate emergency. I do want to impress on you that we are not on the pathway that we need to be on. We are set to hit about 2.8 degrees Celsius by end of century. And this means that we will see more of the climate impacts we all are already seeing and already feeling. This means more intense forest fires, it means more intense droughts. I've used this image already numerous times in the different panels uh, that we've had during these few days of the consequences of forest fires and how by darkening our glaciers and warming them, we accelerate melt. The Arctic region where these glaciers are located are warming four times faster than other parts of the planet. And this has severe impacts on our environment, which you all are well, well, aware, well, well aware of. The issue is that we're running out of time to correct our course. And if we don't act now, it really is game over. And every 10th of a degree matters. It matters because it helps us avoid tipping points. It helps us avoid the ecological collapse that is occurring with every 10th of a degree of warming. It also helps because every 10th degree that we don't warm means less suffering. And so it is our utmost responsibility to do everything that we can to correct this path. And while everyone here in this room, and I've said this before already in our three days, we all think that we know and we are doing what we can, it is not enough. We do need to do more. We need to reestablish a connection with nature. And if there's one thing that we're learning from our deepening engagement with indigenous communities is that interconnectedness with nature is really at the heart of the solution. It's at the heart of the problem. We need to coexist with nature in a sustainable way, not use nature, but live alongside nature. We need solutions that can help cool our planet. It's not merely about addressing uh, a certain sector. It's about finding the way that we can work with nature, help nature uh, to help us. This is extremely important. We can help make our environment stronger, more resilient, and this helps individuals who are affected by climate impacts. It, it helps improve the quality of life and human health with each 10th of degree that we can avoid. So I call on all of you to work together in a whole of government approach. If I take one thing away from meetings like this one is that when we work together, we get a lot more done and we can find collective solutions uh, to steer our canoe in the right path. And, and advance in more effective ways, more efficient ways, and more sustainable ways. I ask all of you to, to, to act and work and dedicate yourselves to everything you do as if the earth depended upon it, because it does. So this year's theme of the public session is indigenous and urban approaches to climate adaptation. The discussion today and throughout the council session focuses on how through indigenous and TK, traditional ecological knowledge, we can better steward our environment and how indigenous 
and traditional ecological knowledge can help strengthen our adaptive capacity to climate change. And how working with urban environments, where a lot of the individuals on this planet live, can really help us respond to these quality of life, human impacts of climate change to address both climate change and better equity, inclusion, and environmental justice. During our discussion, we will be talking precisely about these issues, environmental justice, climate equity, indigenous and traditional ecological knowledge, public policy, planning, management, and looking at ways that we can work together to improve our environment and our climate. We'll be focusing on vulnerability, on intersectionality, which is when individuals can face multiple impacts, multiple di dimensions of the problem that compound upon themselves. We're focused on youth engagement because youth are a very important uh, contribution and sector of society that can really help us rethink the way that we uh, address our issues. Youth should not be facing the burden of our failure to not get things right, but rather we should be accompanying youth and youth should be accompanying us to find a more sustainable path forward based on their positive energy and contribution. So I wish you a very fruitful discussion and ensure you that we are listening. The fact that you're here today with us online or present here in the room uh, is very significant and important to all that we do and your input is critical uh, to the direction that we take as the CC. This energy that you bring to the table will make our conversations and exchanges very meaningful and help us influence the future of our work. So now allow me to present a very brief video. I hope we're queued up here uh, on the system to showcase some of the recent accomplishments of the CC since our last council session in Mexico uh, last year in Merida.
thank you for the video. So, as you see, there, there's such a variety of work that we do at the commission, and it would not be possible without all of our partners, without the parties, uh, the participation of the parties and their team, but also your participation, the public, through JPAC, through the TK, to engage on every one of these projects. Behind this video are hundreds of people engaging on work across the hemisphere, across the region, across North America. And at this moment, where we have such an emergency before us, it's really about providing a platform of solutions to make those solutions visible, to transmit the urgency, but also the solutions alongside them. And the work of the CC for three decades has helped build uh, not only collaboration, but a wealth of knowledge and experience. This is the moment to put this experience and knowledge to use, to put it to work. We need to build on our collaborative efforts, on our capacity, on our knowledge about how to protect ecosystems, about how to address contaminants, about how to think about environmental justice and indigenous knowledge, of how, about how to think about economic uh, growth that works in a sustainable way uh, and, and, and promote approaches to the circular economy where we're conserving our, our environment, protecting our communities, and creating a sustainable path forward. So thank you all for, for having participated and continuing to participate in our work. We will now be moving uh, to the dialogue with the council and experts from the three countries on indigenous and urban approaches to climate adaptation. And to facilitate this expert dialogue and questions and answers with the public, we have the honor of having with us today, Lisa Helps. And Lisa is a former two-term mayor of the city of Victoria. It's great to have you with us. She currently works as housing and solutions advisor to Premier Ebby, who was actually just with us a little while ago uh, for the startup BC Builds. And as mayor, Lisa worked to create deep collaboration across com the community to get Victoria ready for the future, which is exactly uh, what we need to do today all around North America. And across the province as co-chair of the BC Urban Mayor's Caucus to advance shared priorities for cities, another important agenda as we move forward, how to engage our cities uh, and promote sustainable policies and climate action and EJ actions and indigenous engagement in our subnational level. So her expertise includes economic development and prosperity, housing, climate action, resilient infrastructure and reconciliation. So I'd like to now uh, turn the floor to Ms. Helps to guide us through this discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Before I introduce our experts and we hear from uh, our uh, council members, I just would like to begin um, acknowledging the lands. Uh, and as you would have heard uh, in this introduction and for those of you at the session last night at the museum, uh, here in Victoria, we are on Lekwungen territory. Uh, these are the homelands of the Songhees and the Esquimalt nations. And at the beginning of any public session, we acknowledge the lands uh, and the waters where we are today. And we do that not only to hold up and honor the lands, uh, but one of my friends and colleagues from the Songhees Nation, uh, her traditional name is Naamptanat. Uh, she told me once and, and asked me to share when possible that when we acknowledge and make uh, land acknowledgements at the beginning of any session, we do it not only to honor the lands, but also to honor the people of the lands who despite attempts at colonization and erasure are still here on these lands. And so we hold our hands up to the lands, but also uh, to the people and, and really um, honor their resilience. So, and so I wanted to do that uh, as a way of setting uh, the stage for our conversation today. Uh, we have you here in the room joining us. Thank you for doing that. And we also have uh, hundreds of people gathering with us from across North America. And we're going to make this as interactive as possible. We'll get to hear questions and comments from yourselves, uh, as well as questions and comments from uh, our colleagues online. Uh, special greetings to Minister Gilbo, uh, Deputy Minister McCabe, and Under Secretary Rico. Thank you for taking the time out of your very busy schedules to, to be here with us today. Uh, and I'd also like to welcome our three uh, experts. Uh, I'm going to introduce them and then you'll hear from them uh, in just a moment. So directly beside me is Jamie Donatuto. Uh, she's an environmental social scientist who's been working with Indigenous communities for more than 20 years. So very, very uh, versed in the needs and uh, desires of Indigenous communities. 
She's also a longstanding staff member uh, of the Swinomish Indian Tribal Council, which is located uh, on the beautiful Salish Sea here in the, well, there, I guess, in the US uh, Pacific Northwest, so just down the coast from us. Uh, we also have with us from Mexico, and, and welcome to Victoria, uh, Jose Enes Loria Palma. Uh, he is from San Cristano, Yucatan, Mexico. And he is going to share with us today about the restoration he and his community have done uh, restoring a mangrove. Uh, so nature-based solutions for climate adaptation. Uh, and we also have on our panel Squaquash, uh, which means sunshine in English. Uh, she is from the Tlemcen Nation, also known as Lytton, uh, here in British Columbia. And she carries many responsibilities with her in her young age including being co-chair of Minister Gilbo's Environment and Climate Change Youth Council. Uh, so we're so happy that all of you are here to join us today, and uh, we're going to hear from, from you and your experiences and to share your knowledge and expertise with all of us. I'm just going to give a brief outline of our time together this afternoon, and then we will dive right in. Um, as we heard in the introduction, this, uh, this is a really, really important topic for all of us at this time. And for me, as, as former mayor of, of Victoria, when I was asked to moderate this panel, I immediately said yes, uh, because I think that the, the putting together of urban challenges with adaptation and Indigenous expertise and knowledge is so important. Uh, certainly uh, in our work at the city, we engage deeply uh, with uh, the Songhees and the Squamalt Nations, and there's a member of the city staff team here working on the adaptation plan to make sure that as we're addressing urban challenges, we're also uh, working on Indigenous solutions, Indigenous knowledge, so that we're not approaching these two topics separately. And really that's the thrust of the conversation today is how can we weave uh, Indigenous expertise, knowledge uh, and experience uh, with urban challenges and solutions. So first we're gonna hear from our top government officials on this topic. Uh, and more particularly what's happening uh, on all, in all three countries on urban and indigenous approaches to adaptation. Uh, then I'm gonna turn to our experts who will share stories uh, from their places. And then we're gonna move to hear from, from you, the public. Uh, for those of you who are here in the room, uh, we have a wonderful scribe, Eleanor. Where is Eleanor? Oh, no, Eleanor. Okay, Rocio is going to handle it. So she, when, when it comes to question times, if you have a question, just wave your hand and she'll come over. You can write down your question. We'll get it translated and uh, we'll share it up here. Uh, for all of our viewers who are watching on the live broadcast, we're going to ask you to submit your questions using Slido. Uh, and there'll be some instructions as to how to do that. Uh, we'll make sure that we get your questions passed on as well. And in anticipation of not being able to gather everyone together that might have liked to be here, we have asked for uh, community members from all three countries to pre-submit videos with their questions or comments. And so we'll make sure that those are played as well. Uh, and uh, without further ado, uh, we are going to dive into the, uh, the session. There are three key questions that we're all grappling with uh, up here today, out there, and in communities across North America. The first question that frames the discussion is what best practices can be used to ensure community participation in the identification of climate adaptation needs and solutions? So a real emphasis on community participation. Secondly, how can we leverage nature-based solutions to meet our climate adaptation goals, to weave nature back into our cities, our lives and our solutions? And then the third question is, how can climate adaptation solutions in cities consider Indigenous perspectives? So those are big questions. And to kick us off in answering them, I'm going to invite Minister Gilbo to uh, head to the podium and you can share, or, or you can stay there, but if you'd like the podium for your papers, please do, uh, and share uh, with us uh, Indigenous and urban approaches to climate adaptation in Canada. And I know that you've just recently released a, a new strategy. Congratulations, and we look forward to hearing about that. Thank you very much, Lisa. Last time uh, you were just reminding me, last time we were here together in a beautiful Victoria, we were biking under under the rain. Lisa was introducing me to the uh, very amazing network of, uh, of bike paths. We, we share amongst many other passion cycling. Um, and thank you so much for moderating this session. Thank you to, to our experts for joining us for, for the discussion. 
les sciences publiques du Conseil jouent un rôle primordial dans le travail de la Commission. Elles renforcent la coopération entre nos pays. Elles nous donnent la chance de parler de ce que nous faisons face aux enjeux environnementaux et elles permettent à nos gouvernements d'entendre ce que vous, le public, avez à dire sur les questions environnementales les plus cruciales en Amérique du Nord. As our nations work together to respond to environmental issues we face, we also need to work together with all partners. In our response, approaches taken by indigenous peoples and by ur in urban areas will be instrumental in adapting to climate change. That's why when Canada developed its first ever national adaptation strategy, we made sure to consult all governments, indigenous partners, youth, and environmental organization, adaptation experts, the private sector, and many more. With this strategy, which we officially launched earlier this week, we aim to build climate resilience across Canada to get us better prepared for the impacts of climate change in the 21st century. And together, we've created a plan for climate resilience that includes everyone, particularly our most vulnerable communities, because we know that these communities are disproportionately impacted by the effects of climate change. That's why we're working with communities on projects that will help them better prepare for, for those impacts. For example, one Parks Canada project called We All Take Care of the Harvest is a collaborative pilot project with First Nations Health Authority of four coastal Na First Nations in, in British Columbia and the BC Centre for Disease Control that addresses seafood safety, security and sovereignty challenges in changing climate. The project delivers community-based monitoring program and early warning system for harmful algae blooms to inform harvest decisions and provide adaptation tools to climate risks. We're also working on a proposed national urban park in the greater Victoria region. Our vision is that, uh, is that of an indigenous-led national urban park that contains indigenous protected and conserved areas. This week, we also released an updated Government of Canada Adaptation Action Plan. The action plan outlines how we will achieve our country's climate adaptation objectives and lists nearly 70 new and ongoing initiatives to meet our priorities. For example, reducing the risks of wildfire in our communities by investing up to $284 million over five years to enhance community prevention and mitigation activities supporting community-based adaptation initiative in collaboration with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities through a $530 million investment in the Green Municipal Fund, and building climate resilient infrastructure to help communities address climate change disasters by investing nearly $4 billion since 2018 in the Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund. Importantly, these initiatives emphasize the need for cooperation between all governments and for indigenous climate leadership. Because to ensure that communities adapt as well as possible, we need to draw on the traditional ecological knowledge of indigenous peoples who know the land better than anyone else. That's why in our 2030 emissions reduction plan and budget 2022, we committed more than $29 million to work with indigenous partners to advance indigenous climate leadership. And that's why we're working with First Nations in British Columbia to identify how we can better support their self-determined climate action. Over the next two years, we will collaborate with the BC Assembly of First Nations and engage with communities to develop recommendations. I look forward to hearing the recommendations on climate actions, which is coming directly from rights holders in BC. La meilleure stratégie pour aider l'Amérique du Nord à faire face au changement climatique à l'appauvrissement de la couche d'ozone et à la pollution, c'est la coopération. D'où l'importance des organisations comme la Commission. Elle permet à l'Amérique du Nord de se réunir et de se mettre en commun. The Commission allows people in North America to establish common points to find solutions to the largest problems in our, of our age, and we will work on our shared vision for a shared future and a more sustainable future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Deputy Minister McCabe, I'm now going to turn to you to answer uh, your, these questions and share with us what is taking place in the United States. Thank you for joining us. 
Merci beaucoup. Gracias, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'd like to join my voice in the in the acknowledgement that we are guests here on traditional lands, and it's with humility and gratitude um, that we are invited to spend time here. Um, very, very grateful. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here um, at a momentous uh, council session, the 30th council session of the of this important commission. Uh, the Biden administration in the United States has made climate adaptation and environmental justice two of our top priorities, two of the president's top priorities, recognizing that climate change disproportionately affects communities that have been historically underserved and are vulnerable, and that includes many in indigenous communities across our country. Um, our administration also recognizes that indigenous knowledge, TEK, as one of the many important bodies of knowledge contributing to scientific, technical, social, and economic advancements of the United States and our collective understanding of the natural world in our decision-making. So EPA is working to ensure that climate adaptation and resilience are integrated into all aspects of EPA's work, from permitting and enforcement to research and data analysis to rulemaking um, and grant making. Um, and we are also making sure that indigenous voices are being heard and considered uh, throughout those processes. In October of last year, EPA issued 20 adaptation implementation plans, uh, one for each of our major program offices, that's air, water, chemicals, um, all of those major offices, and each of our 10 regions across the state, uh, committing collectively to hundreds of actions that will help ensure our programs policies and investments will be effective even as the climate changes and will support states, tribes, territories, local governments, communities, and other federal agencies as they build adaptive capacity and strengthen the resilience of the nation. For example, we are working to ensure the outcomes of the investments made with funds from President Biden's in a, a, Investing in America agenda are resilient to climate change. This includes our Brownfields program, which will require that all grantees consider climate impacts such as sea level rise and flooding as they clean up and revitalize those sites. Our Superfund program will provide guidance to EPA regions on considering climate resilience throughout the process of remedy selection and implementation at these hazardous uh, uh, polluting sites. Our AIR program regularly provides funding to monitor and protect air quality, which has become increasingly polluted as a result of climate-driven wildfire events. Our water program aims to improve the resilience of America's water infrastructure and deploy grant and loan programs to advance climate objectives. Our urban waters program, which was created to assist urban areas, particularly underserved communities, could to connect with their waterways and work to improve them is actively tackling issues such as water quality and monitoring, erosion, stormwater control, and integrating climate adaptation strategies. I wanna also briefly share a few examples of the climate adaptation work that EPA is doing um, with indigenous peoples and in urban settings. EPA provides funding opportunities to empower tribes to develop and implement, implement climate resilience projects such as infrastructure improvements, land and water management strategies, renewable energy initiatives, and community engagement programs. In addition to financial system assistance, the EPA also provides technical assistance to tribes to help them develop their own climate adaptation plans. These plans address each community's unique challenges while incorporating traditional knowledge, cultural values, and scientific data to implement strategies that will build resilience. In addition, EPA is working on incorporating indigenous knowledge that promotes environmental sustainability and responsible use of natural resources in our environmental and climate change policies. We have so much to learn from our indigenous peoples uh, in the United States. We will continue to support indigenous and underserved communities by providing the tools and resources needed to adapt to and to build resilience to the increasingly destructive impacts of climate change that are affecting everybody who lives among our lands. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for your comments. I'd now like to invite Under Secretary Rico uh, to invite uh, invite you to share on the serious impacts of climate change in Mexico and some of the solutions that your Don't government is implementing and developing. Buenas tardes a todas y todos. Muchísimas gracias. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, Minister Gibo. Thank you very much, Deputy Administrator McCabe, for presenting your results and actions from both countries to work with indigenous communities and adaptation for urban areas as well. Firstly, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to visit this beautiful city and to be here. It was Mexico's turn last year to host the CC session. So it was our chance to bring you all to the Mayan territory in Yucatan. I think it was an unforgettable opportunity for everyone. And now it is a great chance to get to know the indigenous communities of British Columbia in Canada. I'm really grateful for the opportunity. In Mexico, we look at at indigenous communities with regard to guaranteeing human rights. It's not a free contribution or a state provided benefit. It is actually a matter of guaranteeing what is already theirs. It's not something for us to give to them. In that sense, I will now um, speak about the Mexican standards available to acknowledge and guarantee those rights for indigenous communities. And I will also share what we have done with regards to a few series of forums on adaptation, which took place last year with the purpose of creating our national adaptation strategy. First of all, the Mexican constitution provides the, for the acknowledgement and guarantee of the rights and free will of indigenous communities, which implies that they have autonomy. It also recognizes that we are a multicultural nation based on its indigenous peoples, that they are the descendants of the peoples who first inhabited the land and, the, and thus they are called originary peoples. Our General Act for Climate Change, Article 26, sets forth that the national policy for climate change shall observe the principle of respect to human rights, the right to health, the rights of indigenous peoples, local communities, migrants, children, people with disabilities, and vulnerable people. Furthermore, in our in our program under the ministry for this administration, we have included promotion and inclusion of indigenous people, women, young people, and Afro descendants in public participation for the construction, creation, and implementation of our country's uh, public policy. Finally, at a national level, we included a component for adaptation among our axis A, which looks to the impact of, of negative events in our country, considering that a few groups in Mexico are extremely vulnerable to the impact of climate change, among which we may mention indigenous and Afro-descendant peoples who live in very low incomes, in a very in low income communities. In 2022, we had a series of regional forums. They were quite expensive in the territory with the intention of getting a perspective that would include the entire Mexican population, not only small groups. This was to create our national adaptation strategy. These regional fora took place mostly joined by the Institute, which in Mexico is in charge of all topics related to indigenous peoples. This was a national institute for the indigenous peoples, along with other ministries and secretariats. What we found from um, during these fora was an expression of urgency and the need to promote regional strategies for adaptation to accelerate implementation in the land based on human rights and fair transitions. Therefore, for Mexico, it is very important to promote 
this focus on human rights to respect the integration of traditional knowledge in the creation of pol public policies and programs. From the Mexican government and particularly from the Ministry for the Environment, we follow up specifically on the work developed by the CEC and in North America. Among these initiatives, we would highlight the community, the, net, the network of communities in favor of environmental justice and the programs for environmental education, which was promoted last year by Mexico. We hope that these initiatives will be benefit, benefited by the participation of the TECEG, which would be highly beneficial. We hope that as these initiatives, we will be able to develop a lot more for which Mexico reiterates its commitment to traditional communities all over North America to strengthen the capabilities for adaptation to climate change and strengthen and become more resilient to the impact of climate change in our countries. Finally, I would like to remind everyone that Mexico is aligned with the principle of no one left behind and no one left out, which implies deep respect for our indigenous peoples, their habits and customs and traditions, their self-determination and the preservation of their lands, as well as equality between women and men, the dignity of senior citizens and the rights of young people to well-being and a better future. These are all essential principles in, the, in Mexico's climate policy. And in that sense, we continue to support the work through this trilateral cooperation. We strive to continue uh, to incorporate the knowledge of our original peoples, which is essential to become successful in our work. Thank you. This work that's happening in all three countries and we've heard uh, a little bit about implementation and a lot about the policy framework and now we're going to turn to our experts and dive more into the implementation that some of these policies are are enabling and, and helping to support so i'm going to turn to jamie first uh, and ask if you could tell us um, what in your experience what best practices can be used to support and incentivize community participation uh, in the identification of climate adaptation solutions um, and more specifically how can underserved or disadvantaged populations participate and from your perspective this is a lot i know <laughs> from your perspective uh, how can these solutions help to uh, reduce inequality uh, and in under secretary uh, rico's uh, words uh, make sure that no one's left behind and no one's left out so i'm going to turn it over to you to share your experience on on those questions Five minutes. Three yeah. questions, five minutes, I know. Had started to seeds that Jamie Donatito, Tigweed Seeds, Ihaishka, to the Sangis and Esquamalt Nations for the honor to be here today. Okay, so I have a question for all of you, and sorry for everyone who's online. Uh, this doesn't suit you, but how many people have washed their hands here at the Empress? Don't be shy, this is not about hygiene. Okay. So if you washed your hands here, you probably had the scent of rose because the Empress Hotel is famous for everything being the scent of rose. Um, Coast Salish elders share that plants such as rose are our teachers and plants adapt, they communicate, they model generosity, and they're resilient in challenging situations. And these are values that are inherent to indigenous cultures. At Swinomish, which is where I have been for the last 20 plus years and other Coast Salish nations, we teach social emotional skills by teaching youth about plants such as rose. Rose represents love and protection. So I invite you to close your eyes for just a moment and to conjure up the image of a rose. It's sent in the sun on a day such as today and consider this, the delicate sweet smelling flowers that offer beauty, love and grace. Remember also the rose's thorns that set boundaries to protect itself. Rose is good medicine to help you stay present in times of transition and hardship. So now another question. How many meetings akin to this one at the CEC have you attended where speakers talk about love? For me, the answer is none. Yet all of the indigenous speakers yesterday said the word love. And so I would invite you all to say the word love now out loud. Love. One more time. Love. Okay, does it feel odd saying it in a setting like this? 
I hope not, but I think for many people, it does make them slightly uncomfortable. We can expound all day on the importance of building trust, building relationships, taking the time that it needs to work with indigenous nations if you're not from an indigenous nation. These are all incredibly important. Um, and most of us, we've all heard these before. However, how can you really honor these types of social emotional relationships when most people have gone to a school and spent their entire life learning that you must disassociate your emotions from rationality? So I think it's really important to just reflect back on the fact that every indigenous speaker yesterday said the word love. And how do we bring that to the table in thinking about moving forward in not only engaging communities, but making change and making in, in the world that we are looking at now. So these are my recommendations for wise practices and engaging communities, and they're centered on the teachings of Rose. First, learn the history of the indigenous sovereignty relevant to the region that you're seeking to connect to before you ever make an ask. Gain an understanding of the rose, both the flower and the thorns. Two, Seek out indigenous organizations in lieu of academic institutions to help build relationships with quote unquote sub actors, which if anybody listened yesterday, that's what the GAC refers to indigenous communities um, in the letter that went to the EPA. In the US, these could be institutions such as the National Congress of American Indians, the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals, the Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians. There are many, those are just to name a few in the US. But the point is, is that these organizations have long-standing relationships with the indigenous nations with whom they serve. And these relationships reflect the teachings of Rose. They're mutually compassionate relationships, and we trust them to help us set boundaries for self-protection about who we're going to connect with. Three, once these connections are made, ask what the community's priorities are and listen to them, and then ask them how you can aid them in achieving their initiatives. Please don't go with your own project. This is, this is one of the biggest issues that I've come to again and again. Step aside and allow the communities to lead. You may have the best of ideas and intentions, but you're coming from a very different worldview. And it's important to understand that those communities know what's most important for them. And the most important thing that you can do is to help and aid in the ways that they want to be helped. So again, thinking about Rose, what resonates for others may not resonate for you and vice versa, but thinking about worldviews and respecting boundaries. Four, push for promulgations of policies and regulations that equitably place indigenous knowledges as the foundations for decision-making. While I am not proficient in BC legislation, I know that British Columbia has the Declaration Act. I don't know how effective it is in general, and there are many people in this room that can speak to it more than I can. But I do know through the Clam Garden Aquaculture Network that Swinomish is a part of, that they have recently used this act, which is a piece of legislation, to support the rebuilding of clam gardens in British Columbia. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with clam gardens, they are an ancient indigenous technology. They're used all the way from Alaska down through British Columbia into Washington state. It's a very low lying rock wall that you can't even see unless the tide is all the way out. And what it does is it accretes all the sediment and sand behind the rock wall, leveling out the area of the beach and creating more habitat for clams and other species. These have been tended since time immemorial. So these are things that the tribes know about and the indigenous nations know about and that they want to bring forward. These are projects as an example that you could continue to ask, how can we help best Help, best help you with this. This is food sovereignty. This is an issue of food sovereignty. This is also for climate change. There's carbon dating that demonstrates that one wall that is really close to here out in Fulford Harbor is over 4,000 years old. And not only that, that wall has moved as the tides have gone up and gone down. So sea level rise is actually attenuated because these walls can move up and down and then the clam gardens accrete up the beach. Not only that, Swinomish has spent the last several years with our Coast Salish relatives in BC learning about the clam gardens that are already here and restored. And we recently built the first modern day clam garden in the United States. This was a project that was initiated by the tribe, thought up by the tribe and implemented by the tribe and led the whole way through. 
when we decided what we wanted to do, we reached out. We reached out to government agencies about funding. We reached out to academic partners who could help us with some of the research that we wanted to do at the Clam Garden. But the whole way through, the tribe is leading. And I think it's an ex excellent example of just a little tiny bit of the knowledge that the tribes and First Nations hold and all the other indigenous communities and how those can be put into action to not only help those indigenous First Nations um, and tribes, but everybody around us as well, because there's been a lot of interest in our clam garden. And every time we have a community event, which is approximately every three, three to four months, it's open to everyone to come and help tend that clam garden and learn about the importance. I'll also say that there's a possibility that it's helping with ocean acidification. There's a lot of buildup of shell hash from all of the clams and other bivalves there. That may, that all that calcium carbonate may potentially help with ocean acidification. So an ancient indigenous technology adapting to modern day dilemmas. So again, I just wanna say that Swinomish created that particular initiative uh, and we did it with heart and we led every step of the way. And when you're out there on the garden, you can feel the love. So thank you. Thank you so much for putting love on the table and for bringing love to the table. Uh, I think uh, it's it's a really important element it, it, to, to do the work. We need to have relationship and to have true relationship. We actually need to have love. It, there, there's no other way to have relationship. And I, I think also uh, it's really important and thanks for foregrounding this, the importance of indigenous led, indigenous owned, indigenous driven projects. Uh, and I think that's that's a key takeaway that when we're working with uh, Indigenous communities to go in and, and ask what do you need and support that work. So thanks for foregrounding that and the Clam Garden sounds like a really, really important project. Uh, Jose Ines, I'm going to now uh, turn to you and uh, I'd love for you to share uh, a little bit uh, of your experience and your community leadership in San Crisanto. Uh, and particularly, how can we leverage nature-based solutions uh, in our climate adaptation goals? And I know you have some pictures to share with us along with your story. So I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate for the invitation to this beautiful city and for the chance to share with you all. To talk about nature-based solutions, which is a trending term, at the end of the day, anything we don't do with nature will be useless. The link to the Mayan cosmogony means that everything is related to nature and to the universe. This is what we understand and what we work with in San Crisanto. We realized that suddenly we had lots of birds, a lot of water in the mangrove, a lot of fish, and then we realized it was all gone. What happened? So it turns out that our modernization to strengthen our roadways and our infrastructure works tends to forget the importance of water. And if you're bringing a roadway through a mangrove without the necessary means without the necessary tools, we had to break the roadway. We didn't ask the government for permission because we knew they would say no and that there was no money, but it was our problem, so we decided to act. And we realized that it worked because it dislodged the water that was flooded there as a product of two hurricanes, two hurricanes that filled our community with water over this, the expanse of a month. That's where we got the idea to do hydraulic restoration in the mangrove, which we didn't tell the authorities about either. We decided to do it based on our ancestral knowledge. 
part of those images that you are looking at, even the one that's on the screen right now, is part of that opening ceremony from last year. We asked the minister and the deputy secretary who is here with us today to join us. This, this image now is the damage from the hurricane. The mangrove is dead there. That's the damage from Hurricane Isidoro. We took an aerial photograph for that. So we decided to do a hydrological restoration of the mangrove, which died up to 99%. But we didn't plant a single tree to recover it. What we did was to uphold the hydrology. That helped us with, the, with Hurricane Isidoro. Then we had, of course, an impact. There were 11 kilometers of canals inside the mangrove and that facilitated the salt water to go to the bottom and leave that ecosystem, flow out of it. What that did was um, disperse the sedimentation. So luckily enough, when we looked at it, the mangrove was growing all by itself. Of course, this was just, this was not a, an idea that came out of the blue. We consulted the people who work in science in Merida, specifically in the institutes there, and they gave us a few ideas. So in 1995, there was not a single project for restoration of mangroves in Mexico. We were the first ones who started working on this. For two or three years, the state government started to restore the hydrology of a few areas, specifically towards the roadway to Flores. And the mangrove was dying over and over on, on the side where access to the ocean was cut off by the roadway. So what we did was use our own actions, use our own decision-making and voluntary work for 24 years. And then the Fish and Wildlife Service in 1999 gave us support, then we got small donations, then we had Ramsa funding, then we had the ministry and other departments, but it all started from our local initiative based on, the, on these needs. Again, this was not a project that someone from outside came to implement. And this is the main feature of San Crisanto. We produce coconuts, we have fisheries, we uh, produce salt, we have environmental services. We are a teaching community. We have um, accommodation services on the beach, small uh, accommodation. We have services to rest on the beach and other hospitality services. So we are an integrated community and we've worked by strengthening education. We have implemented from 20, 2004 to 2014, over $100,000 on environmental education for our community, looking to create awareness among our children, our elders and our women, so that we could all become stronger in our community and be able to create a strategic plan, which was launched in 2009, and it was a 20 year plan. This was all work created inside the community. The San Cristan project, is endogenous built on the basis of our own Mayan origins. It is Mayan settlement. We used to come, used to trade the salt by boat, taking it, sailing down the Caribbean coast. And we used to trade up and down the coast as well, upwards to the company leading to the original mining complexes of the Aztecs. So under this conception, we've noticed that community organization has the capability to undertake these risks. And in that sense, it can strengthen our local development. So our development in our town is supported by this idea. We are supported and backed by science. We participate in a lot of event, events, this one being one of them with the CCA, with the CEC, as well as other initiatives around the equator, we go as far as that and locally as well, but we're not sitting just twisting our thumbs. So this community 
which started from scratch, absolute scratch. We had nothing. Fishing, salt production on, and um, farming used to be within private property of large corporations. So in 1974, when we get the funding to access nature, the life of San Crisanto changed and we moved, we grew from 20 families to 150 that we have nowadays. We do not aspire to be a large city. We don't want to be that, but we want to keep our quality of life for our communities with a future that is perfectly defined, knowing where we want to go. That is the major vision that we inherited from the Mayans. Remember that Mayan science was cut off at the knees five centuries ago. And fortunately, there's still resilience there as well. We have been able to adapt. Of course, there are not many more examples in Yucatan of this type of work, but this is just a sample of what we've achieved and we can continue to work with and share with everyone, share it throughout the world. If there are any questions, I'll be, cl I'll be glad to answer. Thank you very much. I'm sure there will be lots of questions that come in. Uh, there's already a, th a thread here, uh, which is community-driven, community-led solutions. So we have the example of the clam bed. We have the example of the restoration of uh, the mangrove. And just really, really powerful that no one, you said no one from outside came and told us what to do. We just did it based on our own traditional knowledge. So, and then look at look at the transformation. It's, it's incredible. Uh, you've also given us uh, something very big to think about um, when you said, if it's not a nature-based solution, it will not work. So I think that's something really for all of us to consider. It's a very powerful comment. Uh, if we don't weave nature into our solutions, uh, into all of our adaptation solutions, um, they, they may not be the right solution. So thank you for that, uh, that food for thought for all of us. Squawquash, I'm gonna turn over to you now. Um, I'd like to invite you as uh, the chair of the joint, uh, sorry, the chair of the co-chair of the minister's panel, uh, and also as a young person in your community um, to tell us from your perspective, how can climate adaptation solutions in cities uh, consider Indigenous perspectives and also uh, how can they consider youth perspectives because I know that both of those both of those things are important to you so uh, over to you thank you thank you uh, good afternoon everyone I'm Squakwash or sunshine oh, that was um, before I go into my intervention, I actually want to acknowledge that tomorrow, June 30th, is the two-year anniversary of the Lane Creek Fire, the fire that engulfed my community. Sorry, I might be a little emotional. The fire started after the heat dome that affected both BC and parts of Washington. Uh, it affected many lives and Lytton broke multiple heat records. And after that, the fire started. My family, friends, and community are preparing to celebrate tomorrow. Celebrate their resilience that they survived. And I'm not there. I'm sitting here. Youth sacrificed so much to fight the climate crisis, and that's not always acknowledged. I understand and I acknowledge the privilege I have to sit on this stage, to sit in a room with very influential people, but I don't wanna be here. I wanna be home with my friends and family and community celebrating that after two years, we are still there. We are still the Nikolhan people. We are still Litten. We are where the two rivers meet. Now going into the question, the core of climate action is indigenous science and ways of knowing. And because indigenous people's connection to the land, we have been seamlessly adapting with the land and climate since time immemorial. I think some great examples of this are traditional and sacred burnings, burning the land before hot season, so to reduce the risk of wildfires. 
reading and learning the patterns of fishing, crabbing, and lobster, and lobster seasons, how and when to harvest so we have access, but also preserve our traditional medicines. All those practices and protocols are from adaptation, are a form of adaptation. An indigenous person 10,000 years ago didn't just have the knowledge that this is how to reduce wildfires, this is how we to fish. That came from reading, learning, and being on the land. They adapted and gained the generational knowledge that I, along with the panelists here, and with all the Indigenous people, carry. The difference now is we're fighting a triple planetary crisis. The plastic crisis, the climate crisis, and a biodiversity crisis. Our means for adaptation is no longer to learn, but to survive. There are many solutions I can recommend right now, and I have within the consultations done with the ECCC Youth Council and the First Nations Canada Joint Committee on Climate Action for Canada's National Adaptation Strategy, which was released earlier this week. But I think a crucial factor to ensure that our solutions are sustainable and long-standing is systemic change. The safeguarding of Indigenous rights on all levels of government is needed, so we don't repeat colonial history. Advancing on the TRC calls of action, implementation of UNDRIP and climate policies and programs, and the assurance of free prior and informed consent are only a few recommendations to create sy systemic and sustainable change. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for, for being here. Um, I hope you can go home soon and, and be with there to celebrate um, your community's resilience. It was uh, devastating to watch and even more devastating to think about you and your family and your friends uh, when, when those fires happened. And I think the, you know, the point that you make um, about youth having to sacrifice uh, I think that's something for all of us to really pay attention to because so often we hold youth up, we say you are our future, uh, and we've made it really difficult for you to even have a future. And now we're asking you to make these kinds of sacrifices to fight just to have a future that so many of us took for granted. So um, I wanted to, to really honor, honor you and, and honor putting uh, that into this space for all of us to consider. So we've heard from our council members, we've heard from our experts, uh, and now we're going to hear a report out from two sessions that have taken place earlier uh, in this convention. Uh, so I'd like to invite now the chair of the Commission of Environmental Cooperation uh, Joint Public Advisory Committee. Oh, you're here? Excellent. Very good. Uh, Pasquia, uh, sorry, uh, Octaviano Trejillo is uh, from the Pascua Yaqui tribe of Arizona, and she's going to share with us the Indigenous approaches to climate change session. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor to be here today to provide you with some of the key highlights from the JPEC uh, public forum that took place yesterday on Indigenous uh, approaches to climate adaptation. I want to first begin by thanking all of our invited experts, their insights and expertise made our event a total success. And we are grateful for their time and effort. I also would like to recognize the members of the public who joined us in person and online and contributed to the dialogue throughout uh, the day. Yesterday, we had the opportunity to learn about several community and indigenous driven solutions to our current climate crisis, as well as some of the conditions needed for success. We kicked off the event by acknowledging that we are gathered on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen peoples, Songhees and Esquimalt nations, followed by a traditional Lekwungen ceremony that was led by Lawrence Dick, a highly regarded member of the Sang East Nation. Her intervention was followed by a call to action from the CEC executive director, who noted that addressing CO2 emissions is not enough. We need to tackle short, uh, uh, short 
uh, live pollutants as we also need to mitigate, but also adapt and come together to address impacts that are being felt across our three countries as a result of climate change. He underscored the importance for the CEC to engage with indigenous communities, as well as with youth in our three nations. We were joined by Miles Richardson, chair of the University of Victoria National Consortium for Indigenous Economic Development, who gave the keynote presentation. He began by expressing how honored and grateful he was to have been welcomed by a member of the Sangi Nation. He noted that her intervention helped ground everyone and allow us to better understand where we are, what is important for the people of this land, and what are some of the concerns. He highlighted the need for both TEK and Western science to address the challenges of our time and the importance of working and building a future together. He underscored the importance of the indigenous led conservation and pointed how the government of Canada's commitment goes in the right direction and could serve as a model for other nations. His intervention was followed by our first session on climate adaptation in North America, learning from indigenous communities, which brought together indigenous community leaders from Canada, Mexico, and the United States to showcase climate adaptation stories in the three countries and share their experience and unique perspectives on climate change, how it is impacting their communities and how they approach climate adaptation to build community resilience. The key highlights included the importance of learning from nature and mimicking as we design our social relationships. TEK is about social innovations that allow us to live more humanly. Our relationship with Mother Earth should be based on love and respect and management of the land should follow a holistic approach. The importance of supporting and reinforcing the relationship between indigenous and non-indigenous representatives is through trust. The relationship is key. Our second session focused on integrating TEK and indigenous perspective into climate adaptation and planning. And our invited guests discussed the critical role of indigenous knowledge and perspectives in shaping effective climate adaptation policies and planning efforts. The session also highlighted case studies where traditional ecological knowledge and indigenous perspectives were integrated into climate adaptation initiatives to enhance their effectiveness and promote greater resilience to climate change impacts. Key highlights included the importance of working directly with communities and understanding what is important to them, including their needs in order to have successful multi-year partnerships with NGOs, academia, and government. Successful partnerships with communities begin in a place of trust and not liability. Trust is something that is built over time and in order to ensure long-term relationships we need to focus on the outcome and not the process. Promoting youth engagement and international knowledge transfer is key. We also had an opportunity to hear from the National and Governmental Advisory Committee representatives who provided key highlights from their most recent advices on ways to empower communities to address climate adaptation challenges. And last but not least, an overview of STEM, of the SEM process, including status on the su submissions on enforcement matters uh, that have been fil filed with commission. Thank you and note we will be meeting in the coming weeks to begin drafting our advice to the council on these important topics and a more detailed summary will be posted on the CEC website. Thank you very much, Octaviana. One of the things that really struck me when you were speaking, and it relates to, uh, to Jamie's comments earlier, is that the relationship among ourselves uh, is going to be as important as our relationship to the planet as we work uh, towards adaptation. Uh, so thank you for, for highlighting that once again. 
Uh, I'm now going to ask, and he's on his way here, that's good, uh, Evan Lloyd, uh, former Executive Director of the Commission for Environmental Cooperation, uh, who was the moderator during the morning panel uh, this morning on nature-based solutions, environmental justice, and climate adaptation in urban environments. Uh, we chatted briefly earlier, and he said it was a very robust discussion uh, that he's going to try and summarize for all of us in five minutes. So, Evan, uh, over to you, and thanks for that, uh, that challenge that you've taken on. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just the title of the panel alone takes up a couple of minutes, so I'll do my best. Um, I should note that our panel also opened with the recognition of this solemn anniversary. Uh, as has been noted, um, two years ago today, the community of Lytton experienced temperatures of the highest that have ever been recorded in Canada. The following day, June 30, the entire community burnt to the ground at less time than our panel occupied this morning. 90% of the structures were destroyed, two people died, and thousands of others were displaced and are continuing to live with the consequences of that circumstance. So all in, by the time that the heat broke, uh, in British Columbia alone, more than 600 people died and thousands of others were impacted. Um, so this is where we began our discussion. Um, with this in mind, our panel of experts presented their trilateral trilateral perspectives on four themes, municipal policy and management, nature-based solutions in terms of climate mitigation and adaptation and urban environments, environmental justice and community engagement, and finally, the opportunities for a cooperative North American agenda. It should be no surprise that uh, much of the discussion mirrored the points that you've heard raised just here just now uh, but let me begin at the last point, being the opportunities for North American cooperation. Yes, is the conclusion. There's both an opportunity and a need for our federal governments to accelerate and enrich the engagement of subnational governments in planning, design, and the implementation of climate mitigation and adaptation at the level of communities from the ground up. In doing so, the panel underlined the critical importance of respecting the principles of environmental justice in supporting communities to survive and thrive in an increasingly hostile environment. Practically speaking, we touched on a variety of topics, including urban reforestation, national standards for housing and urban development and sustainable development, full integration, and aggregation of municipal level carbon management targets and accomplishments in national target and accounting mechanisms, financing mechanisms that work for supporting adaptation and mitigation initiatives at a community level in recognizing that the cost of inaction will be far, far greater in the very near future. And speaking of term, it was also emphasized the need to lengthen the horizon of our planning perspective into 20 years. Previously, yesterday, we spoke in terms of seven generations, but at a minimum in terms of the, at a community level, to be looking much further into the future whilst dealing with the current issues that facing communities right now. And finally, the panel spoke, <clears throat> excuse me, passionately about the uh, best approaches for public engagement, particularly amongst racialized, marginalized, displaced, inadequately housed, and um, impoverished communities who are the hardest hit, the first hit and the hardest hit in terms of the climate crisis that we face. Education was emphasized repeatedly, both in terms of reestablishing the understanding of our place in nature, but particularly with respect to youth in our society in terms of their understanding of the scope and nature of the problem at a local level, the idea of toxic tours, of actually showing people, ex exposing people to the reality that the issues that are confronting their communities now, and it really drill home the need for change and to engage them in the process of responding. Um, the scope and extent of local issues affecting communities across Canada in Mexico and the United States was discussed. It was noted that there are significant asymmetries in terms of capacity 
both at a national level as well as within our countries. And lastly, it was absolutely agreed that there is a role for federal leadership in crafting a continental approach to climate adaptation and mitigation in partnership with subnational governments in each of our three countries. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. So now it's time to turn to all of you uh, in the audience and all of you online in the audience who may have questions. Uh, if you do have a question and you're in the room, just please put up your hand and someone will come around with a uh, note paper. So there's somebody just over there. Uh, and then we'll get the questions up here. Um, while we're gathering questions, uh, I'm going to turn to the three council members and just ask you to reflect, um, maybe in turn, uh, starting with uh, Under Secretary Rico, uh, on what you've heard so far. Uh, from the experts, from the panel discussions, uh, just your your uh, reflections on on your on what you've heard. It'll it'll turn on when you start talking. Okay. Okay. Can we get his microphone turned on? No. Not working. Here, why don't you just use mine? You're right beside me. Really? Yeah. Ah, now oh, there working. you go. Okay. Thank you. Well, pues yo iniciaría agradeciendo la participación de todas. Well, I would like to start by uh, thanking you all for your participation. I think that every time that there's a dialogue between different parties and representatives, this is very enriching. As I said it in our private session with Minister Gilbo and Deputy Administrator McCain, the importance of listening to the different voices from the bottom up. In Mexico, our president instructs us to design our policies from the bottom up, not from behind a desk. It's important to listen to the voices of people who are on the field experiencing the issues every day something we always listen at the communities we visit, they are very right about what they say. They say, you leave as an administration, but we stay here and we still suffer from the issues. So I insist that the response should be to listen to communities, listen to the different experiences, this is all very interesting, but everything that we have listened and all the comments agree on the importance of community participation. And that is the big question I have, I have heard here. And it's the same question I have. How can we make community engagement be reflected in public policies, including environmental policies? but also the rest of policies. I think that there's very good organization in the community. I see that in the case of San Crisanto's uh, example. It's a great case, a great example. It's not that common in Mexico, I agree. But I think that there are elements that can let us know that communities are well organized. And as governments, we just need to support them with the respect to the communities and their traditions that is needed. I've also listen, listened uh, something that has been repeated, the importance of being respectful, not only with the original communities, but with all communities, not to try to impose a model for development or a solution designed from our professional formation or education in the government, but to respect their own solutions. And in that regard, I think that that is the agreement I heard, listening to communities, respecting all of their proposals. Thank you. And I really love that design our policies from the bottom up, not from behind our desks. That's that's excellent. Minister Gilbo, what are your reflections on what you've heard here today? Thank you. I, think I, I will echo uh, what Yvonne just said, uh, and uh, it's about listening. 
And it's not something that government tend to do very well most of the time. For those of you who don't know me, I, I was, I'd like to think I still am, but that's debatable, a climate activist for, for 25 years before joining government. So for decades, I advocated for, for things that I thought my government should be doing. And now I'm in the government. So I have all those ideas of, of things I, I, I want to do. Um, but I think to be, to be successful at, at what we do sometimes, it's about taking a step back and listening to the people we're, we're engaging with. Um, I, I just came back from a, over the last weekend, I, I did a trip on the, on the central coast of British Columbia. So about roughly a thousand kilometers north of here to visit four, four nations with whom we've been working for some time on a very large marine protected areas. And, and when I, I visited there, my, my message basically was, I'm not here to lead. I'm here to support your leadership. Uh, I, I'm here to, to, as a representative of the federal government, to be a, a partner to support what, what you want to do and, and what we want to do together. But it's not my place to, to lead. Uh, but it takes some, um, it's, not, it's not something that comes easily to, to to government um, and and it and it's challenging and we don't we don't get it right uh, all the time. Uh, some say that um, Canada was very successful at, at COP15 and helping land an international agreement. If we were successful, I, th I think it's because we listened. I, I met, I had lots and lots of meetings prior to, to 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 the conference. I knew what I wanted and. We wanted to protect at least 30% of lands and oceans. We, you know, we had all those targets that we that we wanted to to to, to, to get countries to, to agree upon. But but I I realized that I also had to listen to what other nations wanted. It's not just about what I wanted or what the NGO community wanted. We we had to listen. It's a it's an acquired uh, skill. It's not something as government. <laughs> We, uh, we, it, we're, we're, we learn very quickly, but, but I think it, it, it can be done. And I think it, it's key. And uh, I was talking earlier about our national adaptation strategy. It's not a federal adaptation strategy. So it's not just the federal government saying, this is what we're going to do when it comes to adaptation. We've worked with indigenous communities. We've worked with municipalities. We've, we've worked with provinces, territories in Canada, because we know um, the federal government can and should be doing a certain number of things, but we can't do it all. And certainly when it comes to doing things on the ground, it's not us, it's not the federal government that's gonna do it. We will support indigenous partners. We will support in our partners in municipalities to do these things, but we won't be doing the work, but we, we can be there for, for the work to happen. Thank you very much. And there's, there's a question that I'll read in a moment. And in some ways that, that answer that you've given anticipates a question that hasn't been asked yet. So we may dive in a bit more deeply. But before that, Deputy Administrator McCabe, uh, what, have, what are your thoughts on what you've heard here today so far? Well, I'll be quick because um, I wanna say plus one to what my colleagues have said. I, I, I think um, uh, we, we say these same things over and over again because they're true. Um, and uh, in all my years in government, the projects that have worked out the best have been the ones where the community is driving the identification of the project, um, of the priorities, and then of the delivery of it. Um, and in order to be successful um, as, as a government to support those projects, uh, you have to respect um, the, the, um, the local community and the fact that they know what's best. Um, and you have, to, you have to respect that everybody's got a lane. And so um, we have certain authorities and opportunities and resources at the federal government. State governments have their own authorities and resources and, and strengths, local governments, tribal governments, uh, neighborhood groups. Everybody has their own strengths and, and opportunities that they bring to the table. And the best solutions are when people um, stay in their lanes, but when, when like there's a dotted line between the lanes so that you can reach over, not a double yellow line as uh, we have in the United States that says, stay on your side, don't go over to the other side. Um, I think too um, that climate change is very local um, and it, of course it's global. Um, and there's, uh, it's important that scientists are, are looking at things globally and that we're understanding that what we, um, it's like the butterfly's wings when um, things that we're doing in my hometown of Indianapolis, Indiana um, are affecting um, people uh, downwind of us and, and indeed around the world. But in terms of 
people understanding and um, and actually um, uh, being being committed to take action that has to come at the local level. You you need to understand that your tomatoes aren't growing the way they used to. They need way more water. Or you need to understand that you're not seeing the cardinal um, when you used to see it in prior years. And we all are scientists at that level um, about our own communities. And I think that's what's most successful to bring people to the table. And the last thing that I'll say is um, that um, every time I hear an amazing story of a successful project, I think, um, or I hear somebody say, let's do a pilot, I think we are so beyond pilots and, and, and one-off projects that are great. Um, how can we take these things and, and scale them up um, and bring them to communities? And, and while we do all the things that we've just mentioned before, which is to respect the local communities need to come come to the table themselves, um, not have them have to take all the time that everybody else did uh, when they did it the first time. So I, I think that's a, a real challenge to all of us as we move all, move all of this forward. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for your reflections. Uh, just to give all of us a sense of time, we are over time. I hope that's okay. We still have a few more questions to ask. Uh, we're gonna wrap up at 3.55, so a bit of half hour extra because we started a little bit late. So I hope that's okay for everybody. Uh, we do have some questions coming in. Uh, this one I foreshadowed a little bit. I'm gonna turn to our experts over here uh, to ask them. And this is a question from somebody online. Uh, they're interested in how can we truly bridge the gap between governmental efforts and Indigenous peoples who best know the land so we can work together and what's missing. So how do we bridge the gap and, and what's missing in terms of that government and Indigenous community uh, participation? So I'll turn to uh, any of you who wishes to put up your hand first to, to dive into that question. Jose Innes? Yes. yes, go ahead. Gracias. Thank you very much. That's quite an interesting question. However, we do need integral collaboration. The government as it is, the government state as it is, cannot do everything without social participation. Now, knowledge comes from the communities. What we know, what we have learned in San Crisanto about the mangrove, no matter how much science there is, this is something that we discussed and there was even a call out from the government. Um, there was quite a discussion at a technical level because this person said that mangroves damaged the oceans. And I said, that's not true. Otherwise we would have to close all connections between the ocean and the mangroves so that the mangroves are not damaged. But we need to humanize our public officials. Most of them have no idea and they lose their humanity. It's like they go to a different universe when they take a seat from somewhere from a place of power. That's a fallacy. We need to get people to get to the ground. Um, last year, when the community was proposed to have this opening ceremony for the session in San Crisanto, it was wonderful because then you'll be able to see the great efforts in our work. The images you saw, the photographs, that's only, uh, that's only a history, but when we started our work, it was just like a knitted net of wood. And we thought, how are we going to get through? Well, we have to do it somehow, because without that work, the San Crisanto mangrove would be worthless today. And something I didn't mention was that from 2015 to 2022, we closed our first blue carbon capture project. San Crisanto is the only community in Mexico certified in blue carbon. Over 600 hectares we have that capture thousands of tons of CO2 with a baseline of 250,000 tons. That is the importance, the significance of 690 hectares of mangrove. And we have been able to link that. We have been working and collaborating with the Ministry for the Environment to leverage this opportunity for the communities and really turn it into 
a mecca for local development. Imagine 900,000 hectares of mangroves all around Mexico. What kind of resources would that generate for our communities and guarantee their development in a balanced way, a sustainable development, or even um, within that environmental cycle that also has social and economic impact. So this is important. If we do not get the decision makers, those who work on public policy to understand the process, then it's, it's useless. We need to humanize public power. We need to get our voices heard through our work, not through useless pro protests and demonstrations, but through, through actual efforts. What we've learned from the originary peoples of, of Canada is really motivating for us in terms of community organization. Thank you. So Thank much. you. I think that's a really interesting point that local, uh, well, elected officials of all sorts need to understand the process of local communities uh, in order to, to be able to, to truly bridge that gap. Um, Jamie or Squawkwash, if you'd like to answer the question of uh, gap bridging, and then we're going to play just to, to queue up to the folks. We're going to play the three questions from Canada, Mexico, and the United States, the pre-submitted video questions next, and then we'll get a response to those. And then if we have time, we're going to go to one more question that's come in from the room. So gap bridging, Jamie or Squawkwash, how do we do that well? I just wanted to mention um, there's a study by a postdoc from the University of Washington that just came out, and she went to local, state, regional government staff in Washington state, local municipalities, also some um, intergovernmental agencies and asked them, what are the biggest roadblocks for you working with tribal communities? And every single one of them, it's fascinating, every single one of them said, I really want to do it and I know what they need. They've told me what they need, but there's no policy or regulation to help me get this work done. There's nothing there to back me up when I go higher up. And so all of these people said, I'm in this really uncomfortable position where I've been reached out to, I know what these communities want and need, but higher up the chain, there's nothing there that says that I can do this. And that's why I think that having promulgated policies and regulations is so important to lift up the indigenous knowledges and knowledges of communities in general. Great, thank you. So that's a really important point. If there's a policy gap that's lower or, you know, frontline staff in organizations, they know the work that needs to be done. They need that policy backing. So that's a real clear takeaway for, for anyone who's involved in policy making at the government level. I would say particularly the local government level, because often it's local governments that are the, the, the front, the front lines, the first first interface. Uh, and, and maybe that policy making can, can then trickle up to provincial or state and, and federal as well. So that's a critical gap. Um, Squawkwash, what do you see as, how, how do we bridge the gaps? What are the gaps and how do we bridge them? Yeah, I guess I'll start with gaps and then go into the bridging part. The biggest gap here that I see in this moment is I'm the only youth on this stage. I understand you are all former youth and you hold like your generational and your knowledge and your expertise. And, but there's no, I'm, I'm one of six of us, seven of us. And we hold, I'm very uncomfortably called an expert, but I'm going to keep that um, name tag, but we do hold an expertise from growing up in the climate crisis. And that is over, our age is taken into account there. And that's all we're seen for is our age. So leading into that, another gap is I'm not seeing Métis up here, Métis people or Arctic, Inuit. That's a huge perspective that is missing. The Arctic is experiencing the most dire effects of climate change, but that wasn't in this conversation. So going into bridging those gaps, having more of these sessions with those perspectives, having informal sessions, um, Minister Gibault was in communities, like having more of those, like taking a decolonized approach on what is needed. And if that means getting your hands a little dirty, um, being uncomfortable and going to community and be, meeting people where they're at 
if that's needed, that's a step that needs to be taken. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Something that someone said earlier reminded me of, uh, there's an amazing uh, Indigenous woman, her name is Cheryl Whiskey Jack. She uh, lives in Treaty 6 territory, although she's uh, Ojibwe from Manitoulin Island. And she, uh, I was at a, a session recently where she said that talking to us non-Indigenous people, as Indigenous people, we wake up every day and we have to have foot in two worlds, foot in our world, foot in your world. And you don't have to do that. You only have to have foot in your world. And, and you know, she invited non-Indigenous people, step into our world. Don't always make us step into your world. And I think there's, uh, you know, that's going to community and, and not imposing, but going and saying, we're here as Minister Gilbo did up north, uh, we're here and, and what is it that, that you need and, and how can we support? So that's, a that's, that's literally a, a gap bridging. So thank you very much for, for giving that, that perspective of what practically can, can actually be done by, by leadership. And uh, absolutely, I think maybe uh, I'm not in charge of this at all because I'm just a moderator today, but maybe uh, at the next session or interim sessions, there could be a focus on, on youth and, and various indigenous communities across the three, uh, three countries. Um, Métis and, and Inuit here and probably uh, Mexico and the United States, there are different communities who have different perspectives. So um, let's share that as a, as a thought uh, to the organizers. All right, as promised, there were three people who took the time in advance to share their questions and comments by video. So we will play those now and then uh, maybe have a short reaction from up here to what they're saying and asking. Hola, buenas tardes. Soy Antonia. Vengo de esta comunidad de Chaxin In, pues tengo las abejitas meliponas con mi grupo. Mi grupo se llama Chaxin y me, nos gusta trabajar las abejas, pues este, porque nos da miel, nos da polen, pues este, y las abejitas ayudan al medio ambiente, este, polinizan los, los árboles frutales, el limón, este, la naranja, los chiles, y son muy, son muy manejables, no pican, son cariñosas, y pues les gusta mucho. Oh, there's a switch over. Okay, then turn my microphone on so I can bring love into the room again. I uh, just wanted to, to note the last slide. That was the last beautiful line that even uh, the, the bees are loving. So I think uh, there's something to learn from the rose uh, and there's something to learn from the bees as our, our friend in Mexico just shared with us. Hello, my name is Gina Bear. And as a part of the National Environmental Health Association, I would like to share a little bit about our Alaskan Native Photo Journal project. The project's goal is to raise visibility among the environmental public health community of the often unseen cultural and systematic impacts of climate change on indigenous communities in Alaska. We're doing this by creating a photo journal and article that illustrates climate change's effect on the food sovereignty, cultural and spiritual practices as well as the mental health of Alaska Natives. We will also highlight their amazing resiliency. We have partnered with groups and individuals across Alaska to share their important stories. Watch for the full publication of the project in our Journal of Environmental Health later this year. Thanks so much for listening. That's actually one thing that has, I'm just gonna, fill time will the next video is, is played not fill time hopefully i'm saying something useful uh, but the the relationship between uh, adaptation and health outcomes and health benefits uh, if our solutions as was mentioned earlier by uh, jose Innes, if our solutions uh, are going to be most powerful if they involve nature uh, I think it's probably um, worth considering the, the health impacts the positive health impacts that we can weave together on, on adaptation solutions as well we are the Water and Sanitation Holistic Technologies team at the University of Northern British Columbia. We bring our diverse backgrounds together to find nature-based solutions for water challenges focusing on small communities. We identify alternative and off-grid solutions through community outreach, develop an understanding of efficient design and weather adaptability for constructed wetlands, assess social hydrological resilience of human water systems, and look to address the social challenges for technology adoption. We aim to build holistic knowledge with government, industry, and civil society, which will foster resilience and adaptation for water challenges. 
Thank you to the makers of those videos if you're watching and joining online. That was just three little snippets of yet more adaptation work that's happening in communities uh, across North America and in the three countries that are part of the uh, cooperation. Uh, it is very close to 350. Five. In fact, it's 354. Uh, so what I'm going to do uh, is just read the last two questions that have come in so that they can be asked into the room. Uh, and uh, the, for the person who's asking the question that's uh, in the room, uh, actually, they're both in-person in participants. So maybe it will ask them out loud, and then you can find uh, afterwards uh, the people that you'd like to have the, the questions answered. I, I just I, People took the time to submit, and I think it's important to read them. So there's a question from somebody in the room here. Uh, JPAC submitted an advice letter to the CEC Council in February 2023 regarding strategies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from ports and shipping. How do the three countries plan to work together to decarbonize the maritime sector to protect, protect vulnerable port and coastal communities, largely marginalized communities composed of working class minority and or in other Indigenous groups in Canada, Mexico and the US. So that's, I guess, a question for the three council members uh, that uh, hopefully they can find the audience member uh, who asked that question and have a chance to answer it. Uh, another question here, um, at a gathering like this, there is an aspirational projection of our best selves as nations, uh, meanwhile, expanding oil, gas and lithium mining and our realities in communities. Toxic chemicals aren't properly regulated and the health of our people and the planet suffer. Please tell us about the internal government challenges you face as leaders so we can gain insight for future efforts. And that is a very generous question uh, asking for uh, the government to outline the challenges that they face in grappling with what are sometimes real dichotomies. On the one hand, we need this, and on the other hand, we need that. I wish there were time to answer those questions, uh, but we are uh, out of time. Uh, I want to thank the three council members for taking the time to share uh, your work uh, and really to thank you so much for all the work you're doing in all three countries on this really, really important issue. Uh, to our community experts, uh, thank you so much for your wisdom, your time, your generosity, uh, and for foregrounding Indigenous voices, Indigenous practices, Indigenous knowledge, uh, and encouraging and I would say lovingly challenging all of us uh, to start from the bottom up, start from what the communities need, uh, and, and really um, build adaptation in that way. Uh, to everyone here, thank you so much for taking the time to attend. Uh, this is the 30th session. Uh, I was thinking to myself uh, as we were beginning, uh, imagine it's the 60th session. We're 30 years from now. Uh, what does our world, what do our communities look like uh, based on all of the good work that's happening in all of your communities and by all of your hands. So uh, here's to another uh, good 30 years and the uh, place-based Indigenous-led urban solutions that we need to build relationship and to uh, tend to our planet. Thank you so much. So I'm going to take a cue from Lisa and from Jamie, a question from Lisa about 30 years from now, and, and the cue from Jamie, love, love, love. So let's think about love in everything that we're doing. And I will also take the cue from Squawkwash, because now we're moving to youth. And youth has been extremely important to the CC. And so we are turning uh, to the last segment of the, the public session, uh, to focus on our 2023 Youth Innovation Challenge winners and to hear firsthand accounts from them about their winning concepts. It's my pleasure to present the seventh edition of the CC's Youth Innovation Challenge. So we have been engaging youth for several years, for many years. Since its inception in 2017, the Youth Innovation Challenge has supported ambitious and creative youth engagement and continues to show leadership of our youth to tackle environmental challenges. We do need to think of new approaches to youth engagement. I, I understand this is very important and youth are playing a very different role than they did maybe seven or 10 years ago. And so this is still one of our challenges, uh, but we are certainly committed to engaging youth and will continue to do so. This year's challenge was launched on the 21st of February 2023, and invited youth to submit entrepreneurial water solutions for sustainable development. I'd like to invite 
one of our former Youth Innovation Challenge leaders, Monique Chan, to the stage. Where is Monique? Here we go. Uh, Monique won the 2020 Youth Innovation Challenge. Her, hers is a success story of how everyone can create solutions to tackle environmental challenges, particularly youth. Bruised was her initiative and is focused on fighting food waste through education and healthy eats. So please, Monique, tell us about your project. Hi, I'm Monique Chan, founder and owner of Bruised. And I studied food waste in university and at the same time witnessed the issue firsthand while working in kitchens and farmers markets. And with over nine years of working in the food industry, I saw tons of perfectly good food being, being wasted and little to no action towards finding solutions. 58% of all food produced is never eaten. Each year, 35.5 million tons of food is lost or wasted in Canada due to a lack of infrastructure, limited awareness, and undue stigma against natural aesthetic variations. When we waste food, we waste all the resources that go into its production, including land, fresh water, labor, and energy. Considering rising food prices, the climate crisis's devastating impact on crop yields and nearly 60 million tons of CO2 emissions generated annually by food waste, this is an issue we can't afford to ignore. And that's where we come in. Bruised is a Toronto-based women-owned business on a mission to fight food waste. We rescue perfectly good ingredients that are commonly tossed across the supply chain and upcycle them into nutrient-dense sustainable snacks. We believe in embracing imperfect with the foods we choose and within our personal journeys towards sustainability. So far, we've rescued 5,110 pounds of good food from going to waste and we're just getting started. By offering healthy, sustainable snacks and speaking out about the food waste crisis, we're both educating and empowering Canadians to feel good about what they fuel with. Finding new potential in commonly wasted ingredients is what drives our passion for innovation in the bruised kitchen. We utilize organic juicers pulp, a byproduct of many local juiceries, surplus ripe bananas from retailers and distributors, local fruits that vary in size or aesthetic from grocery standards, and more, transforming them into our products. In doing so, we find a renewed purpose in the food we rescue, challenge the stigma surrounding these ingredients, and inspire others to see value in embracing imperfect. Our products are 100% plant-based, gluten-free, and nut-free. We utilize local organic and nutrient-dense ingredients to make wholesome products packed with a powerful mission. By creating demand for imperfect food, we're paving the way towards a more resilient food system and inspiring adaptation of a more circular economy. Empowering our community is our jam and we're lit up by collaboration and fueled by the change we can make together. Bruised is committed to uplifting our community by working with local farmers, small businesses, nonprofits, and our audience to help support them in reducing their food waste footprint. Localizing suppliers allows us to have direct conversations with producers to better understand the gaps in their existing models and where we can fit in to mitigate unnecessary waste with a circular approach. Brew strives to be more than a business selling a product. Connecting with our community allows us to give people food for thought on their role within our food system. Our products are a means to generating discussion and excitement about mitigating food waste and we found that once informed, most people share our belief that good food should never be wasted. We are learning that creating meaningful change is rooted in conversation. And yeah, sometimes you gotta wear a banana suit to do it. From the organic growth of our brand awareness, we were able to not only get the interest of the CEC by representing Canada at the 2020 Youth Innovation Challenge, but also gained intrigue from a lot of notable media. This trajectory led us to guest speaking at events, including COP15 and a food loss and waste webinar hosted by the United Nations, FAO and CEC. And since then, 
we've received a total of 50,000 in grant funding with the COIL Activate Circular Accelerator and the Earth's Own Plant Project, to name a few. Our latest achievement is making it to the final round of the CBC and Desjardins Dream the Impossible contest. Out of hundreds of applicants across Canada, we made it as a top 10 finalist. Now it's up to popular vote and taking the time to vote now would be how you can support us. With so much interest surrounding our products and vision, our current challenge is meeting the demand. This win could give us the kickstart we need to expand our product availability across Ontario and provide more engaging educational experiences for our community. When I started Bruise in 2019, I had no idea where it would lead. The fact that I'm speaking with you here today is proof that with curiosity, willingness, and passion, everyone has the power to create the change they wanna see. If you have to take away anything from today, I hope that it's perfection is a limiting construct which keeps us from appreciating what we have, both with our food and within every other area of our lives. It's up to all of us to challenge this notion, start with where we are, and to work together towards a better world for us all. We're young, scrappy, and hungry for change, and we're taking what we've got and making the best of it. And to follow and support, you can follow us on our Instagram, our website, bruise.com, and I'll also have some products available for purchase later today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Monique, uh, for coming to speak to us today. And Monique is also part of our mentoring program. So not only are we mentoring and others amongst you mentoring our youth, but our youth are mentoring our youth, which is a fantastic contribution to the process. I think it creates uh, intergenerational uh, help between youth that are helping youth. So the winners for this year were selected for their impactful and innovative solutions to water-related challenges by demonstrating potential benefits for the environment and direct impacts that support communities with a focus on social, environmental, and economic equity. Among the impressive solutions, four winners were selected for this seventh annual challenge. Four coming up, but they're representing a few more and they're speaking for their partners. Please join me in applause as I recognize each of our young Echo Entrepreneur winners and invite them one by one as I name them uh, each to come join us on stage uh, with the ministers. Gabrielle Kirk and Michael Laborato uh, representing Canada with their solution entitled Aquapon. Fantastic. Arena Serrano Ramos and Annie Rosas Hernandez representing Mexico with their solution, Blue Bond, Bubbles Protecting Our Water. Burbucas que nos protegen nuestra agua. Perseida Tenorio Toledo and Maria Guibó Ballesteros Avila from Mexico with their solution, Water for Life, Mobile School. And Haley Hall representing the United States with her solution, Is Your Water Well? Fantastic. Round of applause for all of them once more. All right. So now we're going to give each of our winners a moment to tell you about uh, their project. And we'll begin with the United States, Haley Hall, with the solution, Is Your Water Well? Haley, your mic should be going. You, you, can, you can stay there. I think it's, you'd yeah, rather come to the podium. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Haley Hall, and I'm from North Florida in the United States. I come from a family of farmers going back for 10 generations. I'm a hydrogeologist and I run a campaign called Is Your Water Well? Just in America, over 43 million of us get our drinking water from private wells. Maybe you do. The safety of this water is mostly unknown. In a USGS study, one in every five wells was found to be unsafe for drinking. This is an invisible crisis. My home, 
microphone here, is blessed with abundant rain in the most freshwater springs of anywhere in the world. I grew up drinking from my family's well. It was crystal clear, tasted great. We never thought about water quality. People take great pride in their water, but don't understand changes happening in it, like rising nitrate. Nitrate is a chemical in water. You cannot see, taste, or smell it. It comes from fertilizers, livestock waste, human waste. It hurts people and the environment. There's a human health limit set to guard against blue baby syndrome. This is where the blood cannot carry oxygen and they can suffocate. About a year ago, a friend told me they tested their well and it came back over the health limit for nitrate. Then I heard of another well that tested six times higher than the limit. So I requested date from, data from the state health department and discovered clusters of wells testing above the health limit situated in rural areas of intensive agriculture, including near my family's farm. Our farm was not quaint. It was a modern system sm sprawling over thousands of acres that produced potatoes, peanuts, corn, and cattle shipped and eaten by people all over North America. It was started by my grandfather, who in his lifetime survived and thrived the third ag agricultural revolution, a complete upheaval where we increased yield with modern technologies and fertilizers. Our farm tested its soils, followed voluntary state best practices, and participated in a university study. My grandfather was resourceful and adaptable, a businessman. Farmers want to be good stewards and can be when we give them the right tools. But despite the plans, programs, and practices that were supposed to fix things, nitrate pollution from farming has spiked and is rising. Our tools are broken. Meanwhile, our underwater world is choking with nasty algae, and we now know that there are hot spots with babies drinking toxic water that can kill them. It's not just happening where I live either. From Florida and Nebraska to Ontario to Sonora and Chihuahua, nitrate is poisoning our water supply. So we must get to work. Since barriers of cost and inconvenience prevent many from testing, I test wells for free. If a family's well is polluted, the samples I take are the first step for them to be eligible for water supply funding. I also educate at community events, in schools, and in libraries. Two months ago, I completed a state certification for groundwater sampling. Since then, I've tested the drinking water of 33 families. I started with my niece as well, the baby from the last slide. I'm organizing to target homes in areas of known contamination and homes with pregnant people and babies. In two months, I've spoken with 370 people face-to-face -face about their water. By next year, we'll have an informative web page and a, a map of nitrate levels. So that's what I'm working on in my community in Florida. But across all of North America, we must provide more access to well testing for owners, and we must implement solutions to reduce nitrate and restore our water. Farmers will be part of these solutions and we must support them. We need a new agricultural revolution. It'll be a magic bullet for our tipping points. And there's so many different ways that we can get there. Just a few of them are payment for ecosystem services, land and groundwater conservation easements, protection of sensitive recharge areas, cost sharing for verified best practices and tech, reducing livestock intensity, legislative changes, market tools, just to name a few. It's exciting, really. There's so much we get to do. So many new tools to make and use because we must, we must. It's time and we are ready. I'm very grateful to be here with you all. Please stop by and say hello or email me if you'd like to and take care and safe travels back home.
And now you see why we like our youth. <laughs> so from Mexico, uh, we have the Water for Life mobile school, please. Un maestro me dijo un día que a teacher río... once said to me that rivers are a reflection of their communities. And today I want to talk about the river from my village. I'm Perseida Tenorio, and together with Gabriel Ballesteros, we have started the Water for Life mobile school to transform the relationship we have with river water. We come from the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in the state of Oaxaca. And the river in my village used to be the ideal place to learn to swim, fish, and the river used to be my accomplice. I would run to it when I felt sad or when my parents yelled at me. However, the story of this and other rivers in the area had, have cha has changed when 20 years ago, sewage systems were installed with outlets into the river and without treating the waters coming from hospitals, households, and some factors in the area. This transformed our river's life. There are now sewage outlets, lifeless, lifeless places that smell bad where no one wants to go near. This is a photograph from yesterday. It was taken yesterday in one of the outlets in Huchitan. Our rivers are dying, and I couldn't help but feel so sad and angry in view of the situation. While the rivers are dying, nowadays in Mexico, 60% of our water for consumption comes from shallow waters. So what kind of water are we drinking? This is how we realized that we neither needed to transform our relationships with the water from our rivers, and we started the Water for Life and Arts Mobile School, where we train young people in eco technologies, young people from rural communities to learn to treat, reincorporate, and make the best use of soapy waters coming from their homes. I must also mention that gray waters or soapy waters can become sewage when they go untreated. These are two examples. These are two of our students, 13 year old Camila and 19 year old. Kino, who after learning about these systems in one of our workshops, decided to implement them in their own homes and schools, and they did it all themselves. Kino even decided to write his university thesis about these systems, and to date, he's still installing them in his community of Haltepec. You may ask yourselves, how does this model work? First of all, we can intervene with an interest from the communities to solve these issues. That means through community organization. They all share the same problem, which is a polluted community river because it has become su a sewage dump. Secondly, these technologies are decentralized and affordable, which means that we can treat soapy waters in our own backyards. And therefore, we transform the soapy waters into small gardens with ornamental plants or fruit trees. The third aspect is that these systems don't need electricity or fossil fuels, meaning that they are nature-based systems using local natural elements to function, which make them, makes them easy to replicate in any context anywhere in the world. We have treated millions of liters of soapy waters, but it's necessary to reincorporate millions of liters more. Out of every 10 rivers in Mexico, six are polluted. We need to make alliances. We need to bring these technologies to our communities because there are lots of communities that have the will and the desire to improve and transform their relationship with the rivers. They just need that approach, that alliance that joining of forces of cooperatives and community organization. We believe that it is possible to reincorporate and treat soapy waters from our homes. A polluted river in Oaxaca is also impacting Canada. We are all connected through our waters all throughout the world. 
treating and reincorporating soapy waters not only implies revitalizing our rivers, but it means that the young people from our indigenous communities can dream and can live in our own lands. Thank you very much. Thank you, Perseida. This is another great example of young people educating young people. So important. Thank you very much. Now we have Blue Bond, bubbles protecting our water. If you please. Hello, my name is Arena. And sadly, like everyone else in this room, I eat five grams of plastic each week. That's, that equals the weight of a credit card. Most of the trash reaching our oceans does so through our rivers. Mexico alone has 100,000 tons of plastic every year traveling down its rivers. That's the equal to four Latin American towers. I love to dive and I'm Mexican. I have a beautiful Caribbean to dive in. Sadly, in one of my last diving trips, I saw a lot more trash than fishes. That's when I decided it was time to do something. So I did my master's with the purpose of finding a sustainable, affordable solution. Blue Bun has the mission with love to protect the waters from our rivers, lakes, and cenotes, empowering communities and doing it economically sustain and sustainably. These are my team. My co-founder, Annie, has a background in business and I'm a biotechnologist. Together, we de design our impact pathway with three simple steps. First, we provide water cleaning technology. Second, we empower communities by collecting all the waste from our rivers and creating income for them. And third, we restore our ecosystems. So what is this technology? Well, last summer I took a course on whales. So it was just a bunch of ocean obsessed nerds in a classroom. And we learned something very interesting. Humpback whales create a net of bubbles to catch their prey. So if one of the most wisest creatures in the planet is doing that, why not imitate them? So we place a barrier of bubbles in our rivers. And when the waste is traveling down, that barrier redirects the trash to a net where we collect it and remove it from the river efficiently. One of the main advantages is that we're not harming marine fauna because fish can swim through our net and we're oxygenating water. Our differentiating factor is that this net also catches harmful oils, but not water. We finished running our tests in Montreal University where we created a micro environment with different pollutants. We had plastic, cooking oils, oil itself, and we saw how all those components interacted with our solution. And we saw great results. 100% of plastic was recovered, 98% of other trash like wrappings and cans were retrieved, and 74% of all oils. We have now created an alliance with a community in the river Cedeño in Veracruz to place our technology and remove their waste. Our business model is based on having all collected waste sold, and we can help with the logistics for this to happen. 40% of the revenue from that sale can benefit the communicate for them to can, can be sent to the community so they can have a reliable income. We also want to sell our technology to companies so that we can save every drop. Our goal by 2030 is to clean over a million tons of waste out of our waters, helping over 50 localities and impacting over 900,000 lives. We know we can't do this by ourselves. So today we are looking for government and entrepreneurial allies to provide our technology and support to create a chain of logistics and find a problem a solution to the plastic problem in North America. Thank you all. What will you do to stop eating plastic? Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Arena. What a fantastic idea to have air help water. It's so interesting. And that remark on nature, observe, observing nature. These are nature-based solutions. Let's look to the whale. How do they do things? And let's collect trash in that sense. So another hand for Arena, please. Hello everyone, I'm Gabrielle Kirk and I'm here today to speak about aquaponics, a water-wise solution for sustainable food production. And here with me today is uh, my partner Michael Alvarado and also the co-founder of Aquaponics World. So we were both born and raised in southern Alberta in the heart of the agriculture sector of Canada and um, sorry, <laughs> which has become an integral part of our lives today. We've spent years um, raising animals and growing plants together. However, the last few years, um, the landscape has shifted. We have increased drought conditions and reduced crop yields. Just two weeks ago, my phone was going off nonstop with emergency alerts because we had 10 tornadoes in one day in an area that never used to have tornadoes. Um, and these are reasons why we've become advocates uh, for environmental sustainability. So the evidence is overwhelming. Today's agriculture practices are key contributors to freshwater dead zones, water scarcity, environmental degradation, rampant biodiversity loss, and 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Agriculture is one of the most destructive human activities. But the good news is, is that sustainable agriculture methods and technologies exist. One of the most sustainable growing methods is aquaponics, and it has unlimited potential in addressing critical water-related issues, food insecurity, and climate goals across the world. It mimics our natural environments and follows basic biological processes. In short terms, the fish are raised in tanks and create waste. Bacteria transforms that waste into plant foods. The plants absorb the food and clean the water for the fish. There's so much that we can learn from nature when we're thinking about solutions. So compared to industrial growing practices, aquaponics uses 90% less water, grows plants three times faster, use six times less land, and use no synthetic pesticides or fertilizers. Um, so I became very interested in these growing methods, but I realized that there were a few affordable, properly sized systems with no simple educational roadmaps on how to understand these crucial aquaponic concepts. So in 2018, we started designing and building easy to use aquaponic systems that could be installed anywhere. These systems grow plants and fish together in a closed loop, holistic environment. There was a lot of trial and error in the beginning, a lot of floods in our house and a lot of swears, but we really believed in the importance of promoting this technology and continued working on it until we felt confident that it could be in schools. To date, with the help of grants, we have installed over 50 aquaponic systems in schools and community centers uh, to grow sustainable food. And we've also worked closely with the school divisions to align our programs with the Alberta curriculum so it can be in any classroom from kinder kindergarten to grade 12. We really found that the liveliness of these systems attract, naturally attract kids to want the, for them to actively engage with the systems. Kids love to interact with the fish and the plants and they recognize the need to care for these systems, to ensure the balance and to take responsibility and ownership of these systems. So our project has had numerous successes over the years, but our proudest achievement has been promoting lifelong learning among students related to sustainable food systems, environmental leadership and innovation. One of my favorite examples of this is how after having an aquaponic system, Picture Butte High School successfully turned their, their school into a farm to table school. Um, we helped them expand their aquaponic system and now they're now able to feed their whole school based off of um, the aquaponic systems. So going forward, we want to keep empowering the next generation of environmental stewards by continuing to build these classrooms and schools. We have a long wait list of schools um, that want these systems because they've seen the success. And this can only happen through funding and support through agencies and community partners. 
Supporting youth is a necessary step to promote innovation and prioritizing sustainable agriculture is critical for ensuring that we meet climate goals and ensure our he a healthy future for everyone. I'm humbled by this opportunity to speak here today and would like to extend a gracious thank you on having me. And please feel free to reach out with any inquiries about aquaponics, sustainable agriculture, or empowering youth. Thank you. Another great example of youth training youth. I think it's a fantastic uh, example of how we can uh, engage with our youth to teach us about sustainable solutions. I've actually invited Gabrielle to come to the CC and to bring her students who have learned to teach us and set up her aquaponic system right in the CC secretary. So a round of applause for everyone. I think this is a fantastic team here. And now I would like to invite the council members for any comments or questions they may have for our Youth Innovation Challenge winners. Where to start? <laughs> um, I mean, clearly one of the themes that, that has come through many of the projects, not all of them, but it, it is nature-based solution. And, and that's certainly something that, that came across very strongly when, when we were trying to negotiate uh, the COP15 agreement and, and many of the targets uh, of the, the Kunming Montreal uh, biodiversity framework uh, are aimed at many of the things you, you talked about, but I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I, one of the examples I, I want to give in terms of how Canada is trying to change the way we do things. Someone was talking earlier about paradigm shift. I don't know if we're quite there yet, but we're, we're using infrastructure dollars. So historically money that would have been invested in roads and bridges to fund nature. Um, in my hometown of Montreal, we're working with the, the city of Montreal to create what will be one of the largest urban park in the country. Um, and on, and the, there's going to be sustainable agriculture that's going to, that's going to be some farms, uh, organic farms that are going to be set up there. It's going to be a public park, but it's also going to help alleviate uh, spring floodings. We have lots of floodings in, in that area of the, uh, uh, not just the city, but the, the, the whole region. And the park will, will, act, will act basically as a sponge to absorb the excess water we, we get into, uh, in, in the spring. And I mean, five, five years ago, it would have been unthinkable to use infrastructure dollars. Our infrastructure programs have always been to build stuff like man-made, human-made stuff, with con preferably with concrete or asphalt. Um, so it, it, is, it is a bit of a paradigm shift for a government like us to say, okay, well, we're, in fact, we've made a decision as a federal government that we're not expanding the road system in Canada anymore. There's no federal dollars available for that. We have money to maintain existing uh, our existing road system, but we're not we're not investing new federal money for for, for roads, and we're repurposing that money to support uh, climate-based uh, or na nature-based solutions. But thank you so much for for all your example. I mean, I could have talked about. We spoke a little bit of plastic pollution a little bit earlier on. There's an an international. A treaty that's being negotiated to, negotiated to eliminate plastic pollution by, by 2040. We, we want to have this new treaty in place two years from now, which is uh, in UN term, it's, uh, it's an Olympic feat, but we, we, wanna, we wanna do this and we will need solutions like many of the ones that, that, that have been presented here. So thank you very much to all of you. you all as well and I, I knew about that whale thing with the bubbles but it never occurred to me that that could be a solution for getting trash out of the river um so um this is this this is creativity at work i'm so impressed not just by the ideas that you've had but how you've been able to carry them through um to in some cases build an actual business um that uh, that is uh um uh, has economic a, a, attraction to, to people. Um, and so bravo on that. Um, you are incredible ambassadors um, for your own projects, but also for, um, for, for the problem of ch climate change, the fact that we can, um, there's so many things we can do to actually take charge of this destiny and turn it around. So 
um, uh, it just gives me so much hope. And thank you all so much and congratulations. Bien, yo quisiera eh, también agradecerles mucho por presentarnos sus proyectos. Y hay una frase que es I would hasta... also like to thank you for presenting our, your projects. And there's a bit of a cliche, which is our children are the future or our young people are the future. But I see that young people are the present. What you're showing us today are practically um, as the minister said, nature-based solutions for problems we are currently experiencing. I find it very interesting that all the projects and proposals being presented have to do with food and water. At the Mexican government, our understanding of our environmental public has to be focused on life all forms of life. First, human life, but also plant life and animal life. This relates to the environment, to water, to food, to so many things, and not just to environment. In this sense, I think that you have been very efficient in achieving projects that tackle that, the defense of life. And I also, find it interesting how much yearning there is in you for the past, even though you're all very young. We saw those images of before when you were younger, swimming in your bodies of water, drinking water from the wells, swimming in your rivers, and you're so young. So that's not that far off in the past. So that tells us that over a very short period of time, our environment has been deteriorating and we need to take immediate, urgent action. I could say that in Mexico, um, with reference to agriculture in Canada, as the example was given, um, our president issued a decree which prohibits the use of a very harmful agrochemical product. It is very harmful for our health and it is widely used in agriculture in Mexico. So that actually helps water, food production and human health. These are small st steps we believe lead us in the right direction. In the case of water as well, our president has promoted an ordinance for the industry to guarantee first and foremost, foremost human access to water. And since we must have an economic development, we must guarantee the use of water in industry, but always under conditions that do not harm human health. So I think that you're very clear on the most urgent environmental problems, but you're also offering solutions. So my most heartfelt congratulations, and I take away one of the proposals from uh, Pedro Moctezuma in our private session, um, meaning that CCA, that CEC should um, support successful projects like this one, that you're not left on your own. Uh, it's very important to see that it's mostly women here, so we're not leaving you alone on the road with your projects. You need support, and that should be the role of our governments to provide technical, financial, legal support in all your projects. Thank you very much. Please join me in a final round of applause to our youth. And now to move to our final session, I'd like to invite the youth to come off the stage. I'm sorry to break uh, norms, but I have one more brief remark. Earlier, uh, the moderator made a little comment that um, sometimes she feels like the youth don't have a future. And I just want everyone in this room to get rid of that lens because I do have a future. I don't plan on rolling over and dying anytime soon. We are determining our future right now. I have a future. It's not that I don't have a future. I have a future and we're deciding how many people are gonna die
die and how much clean water we're going to have right now. We're deciding my future because I do have one. It will be here. Thank you. Thank you, Haley. And now I would like to have the ministers uh, come one by one to make their announcements about their support to the North American Environmental Protection Agenda. First, Mr. Keeble. Thank you very much, Danielle. Um, so we North Americans know how connected we are, all 500 million of us through our shared environment. And we know that to better cope with the effects of climate change on our continent, every little step matters. Yesterday, we had a chance to visit the Greater Victoria water supply area just northwest of here. And we could see how the Capital Regional Dist District in cooperation with the Laguanquin and other partners are taking great care of the watersheds, reservoir and forested land in this area. Their work is key to ensuring a quality water supply and a healthy ecosystem for future generations. Every project, every initiative that is being done in our cities and within indigenous communities is important and inspiring. Over the last few years, the CC has worked with public, the youth, indigenous and local communities, academia and the private sector to share knowledge and advance a variety of projects in North America. We've worked together on protect grasslands and marine areas from the Canadian Arctic to the southern tip of Mexico, better manage pollutant releases, increase energy efficiency, build greener economies, and so much more. Our three nations share a common vision of innova innovation. We share a common will to build new partnerships and to do even more to fight climate change in North America. I'm pleased to join Ivan Rico, Undersecretary for the Environmental and Natural Resources Mexico, Janet McCabe, Deputy Administrator for the United States Environmental Protection Agencies, in announcing four new initiatives that will mark the continuation of our fruitful collaboration. First, we are launching today the Adaptation Champions Initiative. This is a $500,000 $500, initiative to design and launch a partnership of cities across North America to share knowledge and best practices, to learn from real projects being implemented on the ground that build resilience. Cities across North America are deploying initiative solutions to support their citizens as they are adapting to a changing climate. But they're, so looking, they're also looking for new ideas to meet new challenges. Many cities like Victoria are key contributors to local and global climate efforts. They're working in partnerships with indigenous communities like people of Lagonquin, and those partnerships are vital. If we want to do better in protecting the environment, we need to work together to incorporate traditional indigenous knowledge. Through our new initiative, we will create new partnerships between such adaptation champion cities in Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Municipal policymakers, service providers, and indigenous leaders from each city will be brought together to share best practices, for instances, through workshops and technical exchanges. And ultimately, a few years from now, we will be able to implement lessons learned in underserved cities and communities to better meet the needs of urban citizens, including urban indigenous populations across our three nations. Our next announcement is the launch of two projects to support mitigation efforts. First, we're investing $400,000 in a new project targeting fast mitigation strategies to, re to reduce short-lived climate pollutants, including methane. We're also supporting a second project focused on food lost and waste with a $250,000 investment. We know that to advance emissions reduction, we need better data. That's why our first project will focus on developing comparable inventories and emissions data collection across our three countries in sectors like energy, waste, and agriculture. It will help us identify information gaps in our emissions data and share best practices in addressing those gaps. Moving forward, this will help us reach the commitment that our three countries made this year at the North American Leaders Summit. Those commitments are to reduce methane emission in the waste sector by at least 15% from 2020 levels by 2030, and to continue redu reducing methane and black carbon emissions in North America. The new food loss and waste initiative builds on great success of the CEC over the last 10 years. 
Tackling food waste has a huge impact on reducing environmental impacts. It also leads to economic gains and a better quality of life for those who currently lack sufficient food. So while the food waste movement is gaining momentum across North America, we need to help it pick up speed. This time, our project will focus on helping local policymakers and communities in designing and implementing measures to stimulate behavior changes to reduce food loss and waste. The CEC's leadership, resources, and guides will help them design impactful actions in their community. And finally, we're happy to launch our new initiative called Reaching Horizon 2030, an environmental outlook for North American cooperation with an investment of $500,000. Starting this fall, the CC will be working with a broad set of partners from international and regional organizations, academia, the business community, civil society, youth, indigenous peoples, and others. They will work to identify the emerging environmental and climate challenges that will face North America from now until 2030 and beyond. Targeted discussions will cover everything from mineral extraction to circular economy considerations on chemical and waste, to climate disaster related mitigation and to climate finance, among other emerging, emerging issues that should be central as we are planning our actions in the next few years. The, fi the findings brought forward by this new broad network of expert and leading minds will help set the course for CC's next five year strategic plan. Je suis très enthousiaste à l'idée des projets que nous annonçons aujourd'hui. Nous sommes dans une décennie critique où la communauté internationale doit garder le cap sur les objectifs climatiques d'ici 2030. Comme l'objectif de We must respect our commitment to maintaining the temperature no more than 1.5 degrees, protecting the biodiversity as agreed in Montreal. We want the three countries to still be leaders. North American cooperative relationship and to see what more we can accomplish in the coming years together. Thank you in advance for your, for your contributions. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Minister Guilbeault. And the USA, please. If that's all right, because we have a guest speaker um, with a video that's going to be teed up, I hope. Hello, everyone. It's great to join you all virtually. Today, I'm excited to announce that the Commission for Environmental Cooperation will launch a third cycle of the EJ for Climate Grant Program. Initiated by the United States in 2021, the CEC established the EJ for Climate Grant Program to fund projects that support underserved and vulnerable communities, including indigenous communities in Canada, Mexico, and the United States. North America is united in taking action on both environmental justice and climate change. And this program provides resources directly to community-based organizations to support projects that foster climate resilience and advance environmental justice across the continent. During its first two cycles, the CEC selected 29 organizations from over 700 applications, and we're already seeing meaningful results in many of these communities. The grants are helping to fund various projects that address extreme weather impacts, support the transition to clean energy and clean transportation systems, and advance conservation and restoration work. This new cycle will address the theme community empowerment strategies to improve resilience to extreme weather events in urban settings. Since day one as EPA administrator, I've been laser focused on advancing environmental justice and uplifting communities that have been unjustly burdened by harmful pollution. And this program is a commitment to those efforts. At last year's council session, I had the privilege of meeting with grant recipients, and I look forward to meeting with the 2023 grant recipients next year. Stay tuned for the EJ for Climate call for proposals later this fall. Thank you. Now, Mexico. A través de la sesión del Consejo de esta Comisión de Cooperación. Through the Council Session of 
the CCA, we have expressed a commitment of North American countries to impro improve environmental conditions regionally and locally with prioritary participation from our indigenous communities and peoples. We're creating and implementing strategies from and for the communities, gender-based and with the participation of indigenous communities is more and more promoted, more frequently promoted from the CEC. So the CCA CC, CEC Council has granted 1.5 million Canadian dollars for a new cycle of the North Amer of the Napica program, North American Partnership for Environmental Community Action, which will be launched as a call in autumn 2023. So all North American communities will submit the proposals for innovative community projects. Through these alliances, we acknowledge the importance of the work with indigenous communities, which are the ones that throughout history have been the guardians, the original guardians of our lands. And they own the priceless practices and knowledge for the sustainable conservation of the resources. Finally, I invite you all to keep an eye out for the call to present proposals for innovation, which include the benefit of these communities aiming at environmental justice, looking to knowledge exchange, as well as that of uh, traditional practices to improve our region. for the continued support of the parties. Thank you, Canada, Mexico, and the United States to advance the environmental priorities of the region. This support is clearly fully aligned with the CEC's mandate and echoes strongly many of the issues and priorities that we have been discussing and exchanging ideas on today and over the last several days. These will make important contributions to address the urgency to present environmental and climate challenges, as well as address the need for advancing environmental justice and indigenous in engagement and inclusion. We look forward to starting to move forward with the implementation in the weeks and months to come. And now I would like uh, to invite the council to move to the table to officially sign the council statement that captures the outcome of this session and the commitments made today. Well, that's fantastic. Let's give one final round of applause. Thank you for a very successful council session. I'd like to give the final words to the ministers before we go and wrap up our evening. So first, uh, Mexico, please, Ivan. Muchas gracias, Daniel. Y gracias a todas y todos por Thank you, Daniel, and thank you, everybody, for your patience. It has been a very weary couple of days, but fruitful. First of all, I want to thank and congratulate Minister Gibo and the Canadian government for leading and successfully organizing this 30th session of the CEC the space where all three nations that are part of it can reiterate our commitment with the environment and our populations as a reference of actual action and tangible results that can be achieved 
when we work for the common good, especially in this case in North America. It is through cooperation that we can channel the efforts of each of our nations ruled over by a true commitment with conservation and natural preservation, biodiversity and our shared environment, as well as a shared vision that working hand in hand between governments and our populations, we can make great progress in social and environment issues. I congratulate us because we work towards acknowledging the essential role of indigenous communities, their ancestral knowledge and worldview of harmonious existence with the surroundings make an urgent call to restate our ways of life. Predator ways of life that have used the environment and uh, that also imply a call to make use of traditional natural knowledge and to see how it can be used for conservation, especially looking to this global crisis. Equally urgent is how we look to our urban spaces, not just major cities, but small urban localities that are more and more frequently impacted negatively by climate change. Through the exchange of these different panels and conversations in our sessions, we highlighted the role of nature-based solutions as an effective measure to combat the environmental and climate crisis, adding a very clear social commitment to our work because it allows us to implement a perspective of environmental justice in all three countries. From large populations to the most remote rural communities, we see more and more the effects of climate change. From Mexico, we also celebrate year after year the involvement of our young people and the promotion to their ideas and efforts through the Youth Challenge to preserve our territories and our population's well-being. It is through their demands and their determination that from the CEC, we reiterate our commitment to listen to them and share our efforts with them as a North American region. Certainly by looking at the projects presented below, we are earlier, we are full of hope. We need to face the challenges and these are encouraging, including the promotion of joint actions that incorporate traditional knowledge. This is how we can knit a network that will lead us to safe harbor, and that will be the symbol for the commission and the legacy for the region, becoming leaders of well-being in our societies. From Mexico, we reiterate our commitment through the 2021-2025 strategic program and the guidelines of its pillars to encourage the participation of every individual from every sector in all levels. The focus of the CEC in this transforming mood has strengthened the work of our governments with experts in CET, academia, young people, and, le and environmental leaders so that holistically each component can contribute to our common goal, which is the well being of our communities. I congratulate again Canada for their work, and I would like to express to the U.S. our Mexican commitment to work jointly in their next administration. Congratulations on this 30th session of the CEC Council. Thank you, Ivan. And now I'd like to turn to Canada. Minister Gilbo for his final remarks and also the outgoing chair of the CEC and moving on to the United States. Thank you, Daniel. Gracias, Ivan. Thank you for your remarks. Canada was excited and honored to welcome delegates from across North America to continue our joint mission of international environmental cooperation. As we conclude this year's council session, I'd like to thank all of you who have contributed to such a productive and fruitful discussion. I continue to be inspired and motivated by how much I learn in these forums. Before I begin, I would like again to acknowledge that and thank the Lekwungen people, also known as the Songhees and the Esqualmet First Nations communities, past, present, and future, for their stewardship, care, and leadership on these lands. We acknowledge that we are guests on these lands. 
Ce fut un honneur d'accueillir la 30e réunion annuelle du Conseil de la Commission de coopération environnementale ici à Victoria, un magnifique centre urbain où vivent diverses populations autochtones et non autochtones. C'était l'endroit idéal pour explorer des pistes qui permettent au Canada, aux États-Unis et au Mexique. On behalf, I'm, I'm also talking about indigenous and non-indigenous communities in all of our work to face and adapt to climate change. We are working trilaterally through the CEC and our commitment regarding climate action has never been so strengthened as we adapt to climate to climate change consequences. The solutions need to be based on communities considering development. We have many things to exchange. And the CEC must continue working for conservation. Our conversations with the Joint Public Advisory Committee, the traditional ecological knowledge expert group, and the CEC Secretariat led to a constructive discussion of the immediate priorities and pressing needs. This includes opportunities ranging from specific, innovative, and nature-based solutions to the improved use of traditional and local knowledge such as the incorporation of indigenous perspectives to tackle our most pressing environmental priorities. Progress made by the CEC this year is very encouraging and promising. Canada will continue to push forward on substantive climate action here, at home, and around the world. Before concluding, I would like to reiterate that through our trilateral work at the CEC and in partnership with indigenous peoples, we remain fully committed to protecting biodiversity, to work and towards ending deforestation, and to do our part to conserve at least 30% of the world's lands and waters by 2030. In the coming year, I look forward to seeing what more we can accomplish together while continuing to build on the conversations we had as we move forward into the next chapter of North America's cooperative relationship. That said, it is an honor for me now to pass the baton of the chair of the CEC over to the United States, who will lead our work over the next year. Le Canada se réjouit à l'idée de travailler à nouveau avec le Mexique et les États-Unis. Je termine en remerciant tous les employés d'environnement et changement climatique Canada et de la Commission de coopération environnementale pour un travail exceptionnel. We want to thank everyone for uh, your work last year to the previous uh, chair. I think that everything that you've done was very successful with all of the great work that we need to congratulate you on. Thank you. Now, please welcome the new chair of the CEC of the United States. Well, I appreciate being uh, handed the uh, virtual baton. Um, somebody has to be in charge of an organization in order to make things run. Um, but here, this in, in my first um, CEC council meeting, um, it is clear to me that this is a genuine partnership among three countries uh, that are all committed to the same ends, that are, uh, understand that they all have to come forward, all three of us have to come forward to do the work, to have the ideas, to execute, um, and, and to govern together, um, and, uh, and to, um, to see our future together. And it has been very gratifying um, to, to see that in action here, um, and with all the participation of um, uh, the, uh, the First Nations, um, uh, local government, uh, the um, nonprofit world, everybody else who is here um, supporting this uh, group of three countries um, as we all move forward together. I think um, that's a message that has been um, uh, shouted from the rooftops here at this meeting is that we we cannot each do this alone. We must do this together. So um, uh, we, the United States, uh, gratefully and humbly um, accepts the uh, position of, of chair for the next year. Um, I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Zero, for your leadership and your team here. Um, I want to thank you, Under Secretary Rico, and the Mexican team, uh, likewise, um, for all the work that has obviously gone into everything that's been accomplished over the last year, which we've 
heard about so much today, all the different programs, um, very, very exciting. Um, and uh, uh, of course, um, Director Talian, um, congratulations to you and your entire team. Uh, super impressive operation, um, very exciting, and you have a great job. Um, uh, there are many other people to thank, the alternative representatives, maybe they could raise their hands so that we can recognize them. They do a lot of the real work, we know that. Um, uh, the General Standing Committee, I don't know who those people are. Are they here? Yes, yay. Oh, okay. I know who they are then. Um, how about all the CEC staff? JPAC members, yay. The TEK expert group. I should have done that thing where you have people stand up and stay standing and by the end, everybody was standing. So everybody that I didn't mention, let's clap for you. So um, uh, the work that the CES, CEC has done for the past 30 years has been amazing. It's achieved meaningful results. Those are ongoing. Um, we get an appreciation um, once again and always uh, for the fact that we may have political boundaries between us. But if you look at a map without those political boundaries on, us, on it, you see uh, that we are one environment. Um, we are neighbors um, and uh, we uh, uh, will do this together. Um, we have, uh, think back to those of you who can, think back to 30 years ago and how different things were. Um, and we can't even imagine what they will be like 30 years from now, um, but I gotta believe they will be better than they are now. So we have a lot of work to do, uh, but I am looking forward to doing it with you together. I'm also looking forward to welcoming you next year um, for, um, for this meeting somewhere in the United States. We will pick a place. Um, and, uh, and so look forward to seeing you there and all the work that we'll do in the meantime. So thank you, muchas gracias and merci beaucoup. Thanks everyone. And that is the meeting. It's adjourned. Thank you for coming. Have a safe trip home and we'll see you next year and all along the year. Lots to do, so let's uh, get to work.